When Izuku accepted that he was falling for Kotsky, everything got more simultaneously beautiful yet painful at the same time. But isn't that what falling in love is like, Izuku thinks to himself? A beautiful kind of pain? One that crushes the air within his lungs, turns his stomach, and threatens to stab holes into his heart? And yet, there's nothing like seeing the evening sun reflect off of Kotsky's eyes, hearing the boy's deep voice that tells him stories that Izuku knew he didn't tell others, or feeling the warmth of Kotsky's skin in the few lapses in time when the blonde doesn't mind Izuku's touch. Whether it be taking something out of the athlete's hair, to wrapping Kotsky's fingers in athletic tape for him, to pulling him by the hand to go somewhere, Izuku feels almost pathetic for allowing the slightest touch to linger within his fingertips for hours. If he could help it, he would. And it wasn't as if Izuku was not trying. He most definitely was. But effort seemed fruitless when it felt like Kotsky was a black hole and Izuku's path was bound to get sucked in. The night that Kotsky had shown up on his front lawn to give him the dance he had never got to experience was also the same night he accepted the inevitable inevitability of it all, and it was also when Izuku understood that this was going to end in heartbreak and destruction. After all, this was a one-sided affair, and he had the wrong end of the deal. Deku? The deep voice coming in from the other side of the phone interrupted Izuku's morning sleep. In a state of tired daze, he had picked up the phone around five in the morning upon seeing Kotsky's contact pop up on it. Izuku thought it was odd, considering that the blonde had never called at this time. Izuku's eyes were practically glued shut, but he forced himself up on his elbows and pu- put the speaker, put the phone on the speaker. Kachan, what's going on? It's five in the morning. I'm aware. Koski chuckled in his slight scratchy morning voice, and Izuku, even in this exhausted state, thought he was in exhausted state that he was in, found the sound too alluring for his own good. Mm, Izuku hummed, rolling onto his side and bringing the phone closer to his ears. Is everything good? The blonde then said through the line, and Izuku could practically see the playful grin. Can't I just call you to say good morning, nerd? Izuku airily laughed through the phone, eyes slightly open as he watches the shadows on the wall in his dark room. Good morning, Kachan. The blonde then tells him in that gruff voice that Izuku could never get out of his head. Good morning. Izuku snuggled back into his blankets and smiled into the phone, enjoying how cutely domestic this was, contrary to how they usually talked. Did you sleep well? At this, the athlete actually seemed amused and there was a rustling in the phone as if he was getting up. Well enough. Hmm. I should do this more often. Izuku bit his lip and grins. Do what? Call to say good morning? Now tell me, Kachan, what do you actually want? You think too little of me, Deku, Koski tisked. Was it really hard to believe? I just wanted to tell your ass good morning. Azuki just replied through the line, A little? You wound me, Koski feigns hurt. Anyways, are you up for leaving the house right now? See, Azuki pointed out. There it is. I knew you were calling for a reason. Koski just repeated, Just answer the question, jeez. Izuku then paused and looked over at the clock again. His mother was going to get up in about three hours, and it was a Saturday, so she definitely expected him to be home. The woman was beginning to check his room in the morning, even though Izuku wouldn't say that he does anything particularly suspicious. It was possible that she was beginning to suspect he was sneaking out here and there. It depends, Izuku tells him quietly. How long will we be out? All day, Kotsky answers automatically, with some more rustling in the back. Izuku gaped at the phone. Kachan, you know I can't do that. You can, Kotsky insists. Izuku debates him on that. I can't. What if I told you I already asked her yesterday night, and she said it's okay? Kotsky then dropped on him. Izuku made a face at the phone. Then you wouldn't have asked me if I could leave. I didn't ask you if you could leave. I asked you if you were up for leaving, Kotsky corrected him. It's 5 a.m. after all, and I'm not completely an asshole. Wait, so you actually got permission from my mother? 
Izuku asks, both a little shocked and touched. And you're being considerate of my time? Is this even Kachan? Shut up, you little shit, Kasuke barked at him. But yes, took a while though. Auntie gave me the whole fucking speech about making sure you're safe and to not let you get carried away when we got out, but ultimately said yes. Azuku felt embarrassed by her behavior sometimes and then asked Kotsky, and what did you tell her to make her say yes? I told her we go work on my gramps farm for the day and help the old fart paint his house and do some farm work since the fucker got sick and the hag was forcing me to go, Kotsky tells Azuku and that we will be grueling and learning the value of a dollar or whatever. And I think that little part convinced her to let you go. Okay, now, Izuku laughs, what are we actually doing? What do you mean? Kotsky asks plainly. You told her all of that to give me permission, so tell me where we're actually going, Izuku humors. Kotsky was silent for a second before snorting. <laughs> to the farm, nerd. Izuku blinked at that, before complaining a little loudly. You are such an asshole, Kachan. You're trying to get me to do that so you don't have to do as much work by yourself. Well, no shit, Kotsky reveals. It'll still be fun, come on. You couldn't have asked one of your stronger friends, Azuku complained and then exaggerated himself. I'm so tiny and weak and fragile and... All right, you're overdoing it, Kotsky interrupts him. Weak, my ass. You coming or not? I'm forcing you to, shithead. Azuku knew he was going to go because, well, they were opposite poles of a magnet, and Izuku felt compelled to be near him, but he played it off with a groan. Ugh, I guess. Great, Kusuki then said quickly. I'll be outside in five minutes. Izuku disliked how his heart jumps every time he sees Kotsky. It wasn't as if the boy had changed in his appearance. Still the same hair, still the same body, tall, handsome, larger than life. Still those same fiery eyes that burnt a hole through any defenses Izuku could ever build. Still those same hands that held his that one night that they danced. And yet, it wasn't the same. Because Azuku would dare say they've gotten closer, not that he would voice it out loud. After all, Kotsky has still to this day never admitted that they were friends. But through his actions, Azuku knew. It was in the way that the blonde would hang out with him, saying it was because he was bored and nothing to do. And yet... When the Greenette goes to school the next day, he'll hear someone say that Bakugo didn't even show up for a party that was a major event that happened that very night. It was in the way that Kotsky, when they were hanging out, looked more comfortable going on rambles too, when previously it was more so Izuku who would go on rambles while Kotsky's words were always collected and shielded. The shields were still there, but it felt more like heavily frosted glass rather than steel walls. It was in the way that Kotsky might put a hand on the small of his back to stabilize Izuku if they were walking somewhere, and the way that the green-eyed boy might sometimes wake up in his bed with a blanket on him, even though he knew for a fact that he'd fallen asleep on the floor of his bedroom, and the way Kotsky made sure Izuku stayed close to him when they went out somewhere a bit sketchy together, which made it all the more funny that in school they still never interacted with one another. Izuku wished that he would, because... He was tired of feeling as if he was too embarrassing to be a part of Kotsky's life beyond the events and nights. Where exactly is your grandpa's farm? Izuku asked as he stared out the window while Kotsky drove steadily out of Issei's town borders. It was still dark, but soon enough the sun will be rising. Kotsky drove with one hand on the steering wheel and the other resting on the center console. At the question, Kotsky just stared forward and replied, About an hour and a half out from here. It's at the foothills of the mountain. It's not even a town. It's literally just farmland for miles. The old fucker's got a cornfield and a wheat farm and a barn full of filthy animals. Sounds lovely, Azuku replied honestly. He likes quaint feelings of farms, so the thought of a corn and wheat field to frolic around in wasn't too bad. Kotsky snorts. It's all right. Azuku then finds himself staring down at the athlete's arm that was resting against the center console. Prominent veins from working out rigorously ran down his entire arm, and Azuku admired how strong he looked. Those knuckles and hands looked thoroughly used from years of handling a pole vault. Azuku was staring so intently that he hadn't even noticed when Kotsky glanced over at him and smirks. You got a hand fetish or something, nerd? The blonde teases him. Azuku immediately reddens. No, he replied honestly, before his voice got a little shy. Your hands are just nice. 
just my hands? Kasuki snorts with confidence. Azuki wasn't going to respond to that and give Kasuki the pleasure of knowing that no, it wasn't just his hands. Oddly, oddly enough, what happened next caused Azuki to glitch because he wasn't actually sure what to do. While driving, Kasuki then flipped the arm that he was holding on the console over so that the underside of his arm was there, and his fingers parted so it looks like an invitation for Azuki to hold his hand. The underside of Kotsky's arm had even more veins running up. Azuki just stared at the arm that was resting on the console, but turned up but turned up an invitation. Kotsky still looked forward to the road. Azuki was sitting sideways anyways, knees pulled up slightly onto the seat, body facing the other. When Azuki didn't make any move, the athlete glanced over the green net with a raised brow. Go ahead, Kotsky tells him. If you want to admire, now's the time. Azuku blinked up at him, staring at Kotsky's sharp profile as the blonde goes back to looking at the road. He wasn't exactly sure what caused the other to invite Azuku's touch, but the green net found himself automatically taking up on the offer. Reaching out, Azuku slowly let his hands touch Kotsky's palm, and softly his fingers glided around the callous hands, admiring the physical proof of years and years of hard work on the track field. Azuku felt the urge to interlock their fingers, and the thought made his chest flutter a bit before he could stop himself. He aligned their hands, liking the way Koski's larger ones encompassed his own. He didn't intertwine them, but he practically did the next closest thing. If Koski minded, he didn't say anything. Wordlessly, Azuku then used a fa few fingers to slightly trace over the athlete's wrist and down his underarm, following the prominent forearm veins, enjoying how firm everything about Koski was. From the driver's seat, Azuku could feel Kotsky shift, and he paused immediately. With wide eyes, Azuku spoke. I I'm sorry, I didn't mean to- Don't stop, Kotsky tells him, and Azuku wasn't sure whether to be shocked or delighted. It was in times like this, where Azuku senses that the blonde, like most people, occasionally wants more gentle touches, but unlike everyone else, he was never going to ask for it. And so, for the rest of the car ride, Azuku continues to place his hands on top of Kotsky, and the habitual and the ha habitually placed and habitually placed gentle touches here and there and the both of them ignored how intimate a moment like this actually was instead they masked it with casual conversation about anything that came up on their mind anything to distract from the fact that Kotsky was allowing himself to be touched like a lover when they got to the farm it was exactly as Azuku had imagined in his head except maybe a little more beautiful like Koski mentioned, it was at the foothills of a mountain, and on either side of a two-story home with a traditional wrap-around porch was green grass that was growing a little wildly, but it had its charm. Across the dirt road from the house was where the farmland started. Immediately, they see an expanse of cornfield that went above their heads, about eight feet tall, and not yet ripe. Apparently, the wheat farm was beyond that, but it was not in sight from their vantage point. Kotsky pulled into the house side, and his tires crunched under the dirt and gravel road. It was now light enough outside, since the sun finally erupted from below the horizon, and the early morning light casted a beautiful pinkish-orange onto the cream-colored house. Climbing out of the car, Kotsky pocketed the keys and led, his way, up to the, led him, his way up to the porch stairs and rung the doorbell. Azuku felt the porch stairs creak underneath his feet and saw someone some of the paint chipped off. Azuku stood behind the taller man and admired the quietness of the home. The nearest neighbor was probably about two miles away from here on the countryside. A few moments later, the door opened to reveal a tall but frail-looking man with the same red eyes Kotsky had, yet they were warm and round, rather than sharp and blazing. The lines around his mouth were signs of much smiling during his younger years, as well as the crow's feet around the elderly man's eyes. Upon seeing Kotsky, his grandfather broke into a smile and walked forward to the boy for a hug. Kotsky glanced down at the ground before stepping in awkwardly to give the man a pat on the back. Azuku found the interaction odd, as was most interactions Kotsky has had that required a bit of intimacy. It always looked a bit uncomfortable for the taller boy, even if it was his grandfather or whoever else. Kotsky, the old man exclaims with a raspier voice, it's nice to see you. Kotsky nodded to the man, you too, Gramps, and I see you've brought a friend. 
His grandfather tilted his head to the side to take a look at Izuku. Oh yeah, Katsuki gestured to the greenette. This is... And then the athlete paused in his words. Izuku stared up at him, catching Katsuki's eyes, wondering what was the holdup. And he wanted to internally laugh, seeing Katsuki struggle with how to introduce Izuku in a way that wouldn't get him berated for the nickname Deku. Izuku took pity on him and was about to pipe up and introduce himself to Kotsky's grandfather when the blonde finished the introduction himself. Izuku. Midoriya Izuku. Kotsky then finished, voice careful but sure. And Izuku felt his breath hitch as he immediately turned to Kotsky, but the blonde wasn't looking at him. It's been a while since Izuku has accepted that he will never hear the name on the blonde's lips ever again. Therefore, he could barely believe his ears this time. It happened too fast. Izuku wanted to replay the moment, to hear his name roll off that sweet tongue again. Koski treated it like nothing, but the greenette knew that Koski understood what had just happened was simply not normal. Midoriya, his grandfather, comes in to give Izuku a hug. You must be Mitsuki's friend. Friend's son. Inko, was it? Izuku nodded with his head and a bright smile. Yeah, that's my mom. It's nice, nice to meet you, sir. Likewise, the old man gave him a toothy smile. Koski never brought a friend to meet me before. You must be special. Not really. Izuku laughed and elbowed Kotsky. He just didn't want to do all the work himself. His grandfather disagreed. Then you must be even more special than I thought. Kotsky here doesn't like to have people help him with anything. The old man reaches out to pat Kotsky's shoulder. Kotsky shrugged him off and brushed his way inside the home. I'm right fucking here, Gramps. I'm aware, Kotsky. His grandfather turned his head to holler back, then turned to Izuku with a wink and a finger to his lips. Don't mind the brat. His way of showing affection is a bit unorthodox, before urging the greenette inside. Over tea, his grandfather forced the both of them to talk about their lives and catch up. And so they sat in a nice hickory wood room for a while, and Izuku admired the picture frames on the wall with all sorts of neat photos. Some of his grandfather when he was younger, many of Mitsuki and her siblings, some of Mitsuki and Masura's, we Masura's wedding photos, and then plenty of Kotsky and some of Kotsky's other cousins. Kotsky looked angry in all of the kid pictures that were hung up on the wall. In one particular frame, the blonde looked as if he was going to bite the camera. Noticing Izuku staring at that one, Kotsky's grandfather laughed and pointed at it. Kotsky was so angry in that photo. When he was younger, Mitsuki would drop him off here, and she and Masura had a work trip, and I'd try to put the little brat to work on the farm, but Kotsky, with his young little runner legs, would always try to escape and hide out in the river. Kotsky added in aggressively, and I was pretty good, pretty damn good at it too, until you sent that dog to find me. His grandfather nodded. That's where this photo was from. You, should, you two should head over to that river during your break. Although I did hear from some girl down the road that there were some leeches in there. Leeches? Azuka paled. He wasn't afraid of bugs, heights, or much, but the thought of a leech sucking the blood out of his body made him uncomfortable. Those are just rumors, Kotsky rolled his eyes. I played in there all the time as a kid and there were no leeches. I'm just relaying what I heard. His grandfather put his hands in the air with a cough. Anyway, anyways, I've been sick these past couple of days, so there's just a plenty of things I haven't been able to get done. So I'm very grateful you boys have come to help me, because Lord knows I don't have the energy to do it myself right now. And then the old man pulls out a wrinkled piece of notepa notebook paper from his pocket and slides it over the table. Here's a list of things that I really need to get done. Koski holds it up and looks at it. Izuku reads from over his shoulder and his eyes widened. Restall three of the creaking panels on the front porch, repaint the front porch white, replace the fertilizer, and use the rototiller to put fertilizer in the garden, feed the chickens out back and collect the eggs, return the pie dish to Miss Boa down the road, prune the tomatoes, replace the missing tile roofs on the tool shed, check cornfields to see if a black cutworm, if we have a black cutworm problem, and measure the height of the wheat stalks. Kachan, that's a lot, Izuku whispered to Kotsky when the old man was getting up to grab something. Kotsky whispered back, I fucking know, the old man always does this shit to me. Better get started then, his grandfather yells back from the kitchen, having heard their commentary. And then began their 
and then begin their toils. They decided to generally tackle the tasks in order displayed on the list, which meant that they had to first reinstall the creaking floorboards on the porch steps. Grabbing tools from the workshed, they trudged over the, to the front of the house, where the two boys then put both of their hands on their hips, staring at the porch. Finally, Azuku turned to the side and asked, So you know how to do this? Katsuki pursed his lips and then shrugged. I have a general idea. If not, we can always Google it. Kachan, there's no single out here, Azuki reminded him. Hmm. Koski reconsidered the situation. Fuck. Before shrugging. Whatever, we'll figure it out. Before they started, Koski jogs over to where his car was parked, pulls out the, po the pale Bluetooth speaker, and connected his phone. Why do you always play music? Azuki asked out of curiosity, bending down to pick up a dry a pry bar to pull out the nail from the wood. Koski then played Coming Around Again by Carly Simon, Simon and set his phone aside, shrugging. It makes me feel like I'm in a movie, even when I'm doing something fucking boring, like this shit. If it's one thing I hate, it's people who want their life to be a certain way. But I don't do shit to change it. I'm not going to wait around for the movie moments. I'll make my own. Azuki felt a little targeted, but he admires the go-getter mentality, something he was be beginning to pick up from Koski by the day. I won't be bored if I'm with you. Koski paused at that, surprised at the candidness, and gives Azuku a flick on the forehead. How can you just say shit like that, nerd? Azuku smiles cheekily at Koski as he begins to pry nails from the porch and laughs. Unlike you, Kachan, I'm not afraid of expressing my emotions. Oddly enough, Koski gives him a funny look, as if he knew something Azuku didn't, and then replies, Yeah, sure you are. Azuku gave him a confused expression, but shrugged to himself when Kotsky didn't seem to want to offer up an explanation. To think that there was a time when this was unfathomable makes Azuku wonder again what all went wrong. He knew that one day, out of the blue, Kotsky stopped talking to him. He could barely remember what day it had been, with only snippets coming in through his memories. Some words and actions were exchanged, but he didn't know which ones. Something happened, but he couldn't recall exactly what, and whatever it had been, Izuku knew for sure it wasn't enough to cause the reaction it did from Kotsky, because then he would have remembered. Still, he was happy for what they had now, even if it was bound to end, because for the first time in his life, it feels as if he was living, not just alive, just as Kotsky had said. As the morning continued and the sun rise higher and higher into the sky, Azuku felt sweat on his back and the green flannel shirt he had on was sticking to his skin. From the side, he could see a, beard, a bead of sweat fall down the side of Koski's face. It had taken them about an hour and a half to take the porch steps and reinstall the new wood, and then another hour to completely repaint it white. Once they were done, though, Azuku sat back on the grass and admired how clean it now looked. Koski's grandfather came out here and there in order to bring them water or refill their glasses. By the afternoon, they had finished the re ro rototilling, feeding the chickens, and returning the pie dish to Mrs. Boa. Feeding the chickens and collecting their eggs was arguably Azuku and Koski's least favorite part. Not only was the smell of the chicken barn excruciating, but they had to essentially play twister on the ground in order to avoid all the excrement. Not to mention that the roosters were practically, were particularly feisty. Collecting the eggs was a different story, since some of the hens were protected, protective over them. But they ultimately got a full basket and one small chicken scratch on Kotsky's leg. You boys working hard? They were about to move on to the pruning of the tomatoes when Kotsky's father stepped outside, grandfather stepped outside where they had just come back from setting down the chicken eggs. Yes, Izuku exclaimed through his exhaustion from the heat. It hasn't been too bad. That's because you've been talking my ear off, Koski grumbled. So are you, Azuku stuck out his tongue. His grandfather carried a woven lunch basket in his small arms, which Koski was quick to take from him. The old man then gestured to the sack. I made you Midori lunch, so you go to you two go take a break. It's too hot in the afternoon anyways. You boys can probably start again around three, and I'll still finish and still finish up by dark. Oh, thank you. Azuku was grateful for the food. It's nothing too fancy, his grandfather laughed. Koski, take him to the river. Ain't your lunch there. Koski cracked his neck and then complied. All right, see you later, old man. Have fun, the man in question insists. 
The path to the river was an odd one. The two of them had to walk down the side of a dirt road, which was already one, only one for miles, side by side with the lunch basket in Koski's arm. The sun was beating down on them, and their shoe kicked up dust with every step. Azuku's body felt sludge from the heat. Son of a bitch came at me and I had to fucking run like hell, Koski was telling some story a while back, from a while back when he was at the farm. So, that's why I cannot stand cougars. They always jump out of rocks and shit, catching you off guard. It's cheating. Who would win in a fight now? Izuku asked. You were the cougar. Koski laughed at this as they took a detour off the road and wadded through the tall grass that made may or may not have ticks in them, going towards the woods. I'd love to say me, but who fucking knows? Maybe we could call the fucker out for a rematch. Bakugo versus Cougar. Round two. But this time, I ain't running. Only dying, Izuku teases. But no running. Koski ruffles Izuku's hairs, hair as they entered the woody area. The blonde weaves through the forest as if he knew the path by heart. How about you, shit nerd? Any animal horror stories? Well, Izuku looked up at the sky to think about it. One time when I was really little, my dad took me out to this rice field so he could visit an old friend from high school, and when he wasn't looking, I fell into the flooded fields, and when I came up, about five leeches were stuck on my legs. Holy shit. Koski keckles. That's fucking rough. Yeah. Azuku scratches his neck. That's why I'm not particularly keen on going into the creek. Koski shook his head as they walked towards the edge of the forest, where Azuku could now hear the sounds of a river flowing gently. There's no damn leeches. How do you know? Azuku doubts. I've been here more times than anyone else when I was a brat. Never seen a leech, Koski replies. But times have changed, Azuku argues. Not here, Koski tells him. Not in Issei. Not out here on the farm. Not for another four cities over. Nothing changes. Anyways, we're here. It's up ahead. Azuku turns his head to see that they were now about to break through the tree line. As they approached the river, the surrounding trees looked to be more and more scarce. There wasn't much shrubbery, so it was easy to walk through. The river itself was not particularly wide, about 30 feet across and looked to be about 10 feet deep max. It flowed slowly, enough to, that the current wouldn't wash anyone away, and the water itself was a pretty greenish blue, which was a telltale sign of a clean body of fresh water. On the other bank was where the tree line continued again. The sun's rays glistened on the surface, and Koski set the basket down near the trunk of a large tree that had a thick branch high up that hung about ten feet above the water. And from the branch, Azuku notices a dense rope tied to the thickest part, most likely for people who wanted to swing into the water. Taking note of that, Azuku then sits down next to Koski on fallen pine needles, and they pull out the food his grandfather had made to eat. Azuku hadn't even realized how hungry he has been until he bit the corner of a sandwich. The two of them, needing to refuel their energy, gulfed down the food easily and went for the other things within the basket. Chips, fruit, some harvested tomato salad, and they sat near the river, talking between their bites. Finally, the two washed down the food with water before sitting back to let it all digest. Once in a while, a small fish would jump out of the water and surprise them. But other than that, it was peaceful and quiet, other than the sound of Kotsky's music playing. At some point, Azuku pulled out his phone to check the time. It's only one. We have two hours before we have to go back. Azuku then looks up, looked up at Kotsky. What should we do? Kotsky then stands up and stretches his legs and does a mischievous grin. Tells Azuku, get up, Deku. Azuku slowly climbed up from his sitting position while eyeing Kotsky. You're swinging into the water, aren't you? He shouldn't have even asked. Kotsky switched the little, the song to Little Lies by Fleetwood Mac, which Izuku thought was a perfect, was perfect for a day at the river before tossing it to the side and unbuttoning his white shirt. Izuku watched as Kotsky looked up at the, up midway through taking it off to catch Izuku's eyes on him. Embarrassed, the green ant looked off to the side, but Kotsky didn't say anything. When the shirt was off, Azuku was free to admire under the ruse that he was just talking to Kotsky. It was the thousandth time he had seen Kotsky half-naked at this point, but the shock of how incredibly well-defined Kotsky was 
especially now with his skin more tan as the season comes along, never goes away. Damn right I am, Koski finally says as he tosses the shirt to the ground. And you are too. But leeches, Izuku gestures towards the river, stepping back. Koski threw his hands up. I've told you for the millionth fucking time, there's no leeches. And you have given me some bullshit philosophical reasoning about how. Izuku makes exaggerated mimicking hand gestures. Nothing changes in Ise or on the farm. Like, sure, people might not change, but that doesn't mean leeches won't somehow find their way into a river, Kachan. To interrupt Azuku's rambling, Koski rolled his eyes and sauntered over to where Azuku was, until he was mere inches away, and grabbed the collar of Azuku's flannel. Azuku, shocked at the action, stepped backwards only for Koski to step forward once more. And then the blonde began to unbutton the top of Azuku's shirt, eyes trained on the buttons. You're getting in. Azuku's cheeks flared up, and their proximity in Koski's hands undoing his shirt throws him off guard. He stares up at Kotsky as those rough fingers move his, move down his chest. If there are leeches, I'll pay for your therapy. Kotsky makes a deal and undoes the last button. Azuku just lets the flannel slip off his shoulder, and that's when Kotsky meets his eyes, looking down at the greenette with barely inches between them. Azuku hasn't said anything the entire time. It would be easy to reach up and meet halfway. So easy. And yet neither of them do it. The fuck isn't, nerd? Koski breaks the silence before stepping back, giving Izuku room to breathe. Izuku opened his mouth before closing it and opening it again, saying with a slight laugh, You have a habit of taking off my clothes, Kachan. Koski thinks about it, pausing for a moment to tongue his cheek and looked at a rock as if recalling if this was true. The kickoff, the lake party, and just now. Before switching his gaze over to Izuku. Seems like I do. You uncomfortable or something? Azuku goes to undo his pants, letting them fall to the ground as he steps out, and he looks up at Kotsky's eyes. No? Kotsky goes first, simply because the taller seemed to have extensive experience in doing this. Kotsky then held on to the main trunk of the tree and reached his arms over to the water to grab a hold of the rope. When his grip, when his hand got a grip, Kotsky pulls it back and steps away from the tree further into the land until there seems like there is going to be enough momentum to swing him far into the river. Izuku watches and takes note, and then, grabbing on with both arms and securing himself, Koski then runs forward and right as he meets the border, between the edge and where the river begins, the athlete tucks his feet in and around the rope, swinging forward, and at the maximum point in the boy's trajectory with a loud holler, Koski lets go and flies into the water with a loud splash, and Izuku laughs at the beautiful moment, and Koski gets up. He pushes his wet hair out of his face, and then yells out, Your turn, shit nerd! I'm coming, I'm coming, Izuku says as he makes his way to the edge of the tree, waiting for the rope to swing back his way and grabbing onto it before it can go back into his pendulum motion. And bringing the rope back, Azuku did the same until he could run forward, push off the ground, and at maximum height, releases the rope to fall into a spot next to Kotsky with a fun scream. Azuku bursts out into laughter when he rises to the surface, treading water and shaking his hair. He felt like a kid again, except better. The sun shone through the tree canopy and onto the water, causing Azuku to shield his eyes while treading with one arm. The water wasn't even that cold. Azuku nudges the other from under the water. So? Azuku slyly looks over to the blonde and jokes. It might be worth the leeches. Might? Katsuki chuckles. What can I do to make it fully worth it? The blonde asks as he swims a bit closer. Azuku meets him halfway and pretends to think on it. You tell me, Kachan. Katsuki gives him a lazy grin with a head tilted slightly up as they swam closer to each other. Getting flirty now, huh, Deku? It was a playful comment, so Izuku ended up throwing his head back in laughter, and Koski followed suit. Seeing Koski's smile was one of the nicest moments Izuku could witness. He wonders what he looks like in Koski's eyes, if his eyes were still as creepy as the blonde always said they were, if his smile was anything of note, if the water on his hair made him look silly, or if he looked pretty with it. He looked up at Koski, who in turn tilted his head down at the grinette, still treading water. 
with the pretty music in the background, Izuku wishes that he could kiss the other, for real this time, and not under some guise. Kasuki broke eye contact and began swimming towards the bank, hollering back to Izuku. The blonde asked him, Come on, don't tell me you're only gonna do it once, Deku. Izuku, getting back into the environment, started swimming to the bank behind Kotsky. Coming! When three o'clock almost arrived, the two boys were laid back on the riverbank, bodies sore from exhaustion and treading water. Izuku's back was slightly sticky from the river water, and he was sure when he sat up, pine needles would be matted onto his back. And yet, he didn't care, because laying in the warm countryside sun, drying off after repeatedly rope swinging into the water with the boy he were tragically falling in love with, was going to stick in Izuku's mind for a while as one of the more beautiful moments to have come his way. At one point, both Kotsky and Izuku attempted to get on the rope at once and jump off at the same time, but Kotsky ended up losing his footing and fell early, causing water to go up Izuku's nose from laughing too hard. And now, with a nice, upbeat song in the background to the mellow, out-the-wild mood from earlier, Izuku relaxes. We have to go back to the farm in a moment, Izuku announces with his eyes still closed, soaking in the sun. Kotsky hummed. That's in a moment. Don't rush. Izuku smiled. I still can't believe you talked to my mom for permission. How was that? Not fun, Kotsky replies. But you're here, so it doesn't matter. Izuki looked over at Kotsky and then quietly took note of, with a fluttering heart, how Kotsky has his own way of saying that he likes his company without ever saying it outright. Izuki knew that to some degree, which he was that he was appreciated. After a few more minutes by the creek, the two boys trudged back up with wet boxers that made their actual clothes slightly damp. Once they got back to the farm, it was time to sludge again. There was still about half of the list to complete, and it was already about 3.20 by the time they made it back and was ready to go. Pruning the tomatoes was much more difficult than either of them had originally thought. Azuka and Kotsky decided right then that they do not possess a green thumb, and Inko, who enjoyed gardening, may be disappointed in Izuku for this. It got down in about an hour, making it halfway through four o'clock it got yeah, making it halfway through four o'clock by the time they were ready to do the next thing. And Kosti predicted that replacing the tiles of the stool shed or tool shed would take another two hours or so, considering that they had to uninstall and reinstall so many components. And so the two started immediately to ensure that the sun stayed up. Indeed, it had, because by the time six or so rolled around, the sun was beginning its trajectory to the ground once more. They had completed the stool shed and now only had the cornfield and the wheat fields to go. Both of those tasks were relatively easy. For the cornfields, they simply would just have to look at the stalks and branches for a certain type of pest. As for the wheat fields, they really only needed to take a couple of measurements and average them together. And so, the two stands in front of the corn stalks at the moment, staring up at the eight feet stalks that threatened to engulf them. The breeze was picking up a little bit, and the clouds above them were plentiful. The cornfield was a massive plot that looked like it never ended. The entrance was right up ahead, but it was tiny and branched out in several directions, similar to a corn maze. Kotsky's grandfather designed it like it was simply because he wanted to, a way to go through the cornfield efficiently. So, we just check to see if there's a pest problem? Azuku asked the blonde. Kotsky shrugged. Yeah, that about sums it up. Hmm. Azuku nods to himself. How do we do that exactly? Kotsky entered the maze hedge and pulls down a stalk from the side before turning to Azuku. You check here and there if there are lots of stalks that look exactly like some fuckers have eaten it, or if it has rotting parts inside. This shit doesn't take too long, only about half an hour. Azuku replies with an okay before taking the opposite side of the dirt path in between where the corn was planted, which is probably around two feet wide in total, and so the two boys had to squish or walk parallel so that they didn't run into each other in the tiny spaces between the rows where they were planted. For the next about 20 or so, they weaved in and out of the cornfield, stopping here and there to check for any odd signs of damage in the leaves and fruiting body. It was not a particularly exciting activity, however, the job was easy to do. So far, Azuku had not seen any damage other than two areas of the cornfield, 
and that was not because of pests, but for other reasons. They would make an area with a blue pass. They would make that area with a blue mark that area with a blue plastic tie, so that Katsuki's grandfather would later be able to go through and see which parts he needed to look at. As they neared the half hour, Azuki was convinced that the cornfield did not have a pest problem and told Kotsky such. Azuki stares down at the flawless stalks of corn he just pulled down and frowns. Kotchan, I don't think there's anything wrong with the corn, Azuki tells the other. It all just looks normal. He turned over and looked at the plant some more to double check, and when he didn't hear an answer, Azuki paused. He didn't hear no answer, but he heard no sound either. Dropping the corn and looking up, Azuku turned his head both ways to realize that Kotsky was no longer there, but had left him somewhere. Blinking fast, Azuku turned back and forth in his spot, wondering if it was intentional or they accidentally got lost. But knowing Kotsky, Azuku would say it was intention. Deku! A shout was heard from far away through the maze. I've given you a head start. Now run! I'm gonna get your ass! Azuku's eyes widened, and he cursed out to Kotsky. You're a bad person, Kachan! Before realizing his mistake, he had already been giving a head start, and so now he just revealed his general location by having a response to Kotsky. And the blonde didn't take too long to reply. Shouldn't have done that! Kotsky yells from somewhere within the w- corn maze. Azuku agrees. He shouldn't have. Because if he had not, then Azuku would also not be currently hearing the sounds of fast rustling moving quickly through the corn stalks. And knowing it was Kotsky and how athletic he was, Azuku began r- running. The leaves shuffled in between them, and the sharpness of it scratches their legs here and there. Azuku felt the urge to look back every five seconds to see if Kotsky was close behind, and it felt like the sounds of rustling were coming closer. Going into his maximum speed, Azuku kept reminding himself to take a million turns. If he takes as many turns, then he will lose the blonde faster. And so, at every corner he can find, Azuku takes a sporadic zigzag motion until it was harder to hear where Kotsky was. Azuku was grinning the whole time from the adrenaline of being chased, and he stopped for a second to catch his breath, knowing that it would be especially hard for Kotsky to find him if he was staying still and not ma- making rustling noises. You can't hide, Kotsky shouts from not too far away, and Azuku was not expecting the blonde to be so near. Immediately, he begins running around, pushing past the stalks that threaten to cut his fingers and legs. At the continuation of movement, Kotsky hollers as he picks up the sound and starts running again, too. Azuku was pushing through some eight feet tall stalks when the boy stumbled and was shocked by the sudden change in atmosphere. He knew that behind the massive cornfield where Kotsky's grandfather wheat farm began, but he was so used to running through the green corn that now that suddenly seeing fields of yellow that seemed to go on forever jolted him. The wheat farm was absolutely stunning. Behind him now was the edge line of the corn, and all he could see were wheat fields with its gorgeous pale yellow stalks that blew in the direction of the wind. The 6.40 p.m. sun's glow poured over the fields like a molted gold, and it looked as if it, if it will never end. How beautiful. Azuku's breath was taken, and he put his hands on his knees to rest while breathing heavily. However, suddenly, from about twenty feet to his left, Akatsuki pops out from the cornfields and comes face to face with the wheat fields as well. But unlike Azuku, who stops to stare at the sight, Akatsuki ran straight towards the shorter, shorter male, who was taken so off guard that he lost focus, allowing himself to be caught. I got you, shit nerd! Akatsuki laughed out loud as he ran towards the green net. Then, to Azuka's surprise, Kotsky tackles him by picking him up by the waist, lifting him up and spinning him around in the air. The gentle breeze blew pieces of green hair across his forehead as he spun around in two circles, and Azuku laughed with his head tilted back. He lifted his arms to catch the breeze here up high, and everything was too stunning. Azuku then wrapped his legs around Kotsky's waist and puts his arms around the blonde's shoulders. For stability, Kotsky moves his arms from the boy's waist to the bottom of his thighs, and Azuku could not help but feel as if their position was a little more intimate. Maybe for Kotsky, it wasn't anything, but to Azuku, his heart was racing faster being held up like this. He tilted his head down to look at Kotsky, who shifted his gaze from the golden fields up to Azuku. From Kotsky's pocket, the pale speaker was playing these dreams, and Azuku finds himself relating to the lyrics too much. No matter what he tried to do, the athlete will show up in his dreams, and within his slumber, the athlete holds him just like this, touches him just like this. The golden sun of Issei illuminates his face just like this.
Lost in a trance, not breaking eye contact with Kotsky, Izuka forgets that he was not in one of his dreams, and he shouldn't do what he was about to do. And yet, he did it anyways. Izuka brings a hand up from Kotsky's shoulder to carefully place on the side of the blonde's face, startling the other. Izuka's eyes looked at him with a curious gaze, wondering how someone could steal his breath away like this. As his palm caresses Kotsky's face, the rough skin met his fingertips with warmth and Koski looked as if he was waiting to see what Izuku was going to do. Izuku brought their foreheads together, just leaning gently against Koski's temple, and with a breathy voice, the Grina asked the other, Say it again. Koski raised a brow. Say what? Izuku thinks back to this exact conversation they had that night that Koski had come over so that Izuku could help him with some homework, and ended up staying the night. He repeats what Kotsky had said to Izuku when he had said his real name. My name? Izuku's breath hitched. Say it again. He had been so shocked by how sudden and unexpected it was for Kotsky to have introduced him with his name earlier that he couldn't experience it fully. It's been a long time since Kotsky had called him Deku in a malicious way, but that didn't mean Izuku on the blonde's lips was on the blonde's tongue excited him any less. The blonde searched through his eyes for a reason and was silent for a moment. Izuku's hands were still on the other's face, and Kotsky then said it in his usual gruff voice, Izuku. The athlete calls out to him. The boy in question could cry right now, but he holds it back in favor of smiling ridiculously, wide eyes, wide that his eyes looked like crescents and his teeth stretched wide. Izuku's, or Kotsky's expression widens at this for a second before it goes back into a neutral and observant face. This time hearing it, Izuku felt as if he could fully enjoy it. The wind was picking up a bit, and Kotsky used an arm to reach up and take Izuku's hand off his face. The action reminded Izuku that he had definitely done something Kotsky didn't particularly like. The athlete didn't do gentle. And then Kotsky settled him down on the ground again in front of him, and Izuku's neck tilted up to the taller boy. Kotsky stares up at the sky. The clouds were moving quickly, and Izuku's flannel flapped in the breeze a bit. The winds are coming from the east, Kotsky announced, while observing the sky. They're going to get pretty fucking strong. Izuku frowned. What would that mean? Kotsky then looks down at Izuku, their height difference prominent, and Izuku sees the background of the sky moving behind him. The blonde's hair is flowing gently, and his dark eyes stare at him. Kotsky then answers him. It means a storm's coming. The signs of a storm coming became more and more prominent as the next week and a half moves by. Sometimes Azuki would stop in his steps on the way to school and enjoy the strong but warm breeze hitting his body, and if no one was around, he'd spread his arms wide and feel it fully. As Azuku has thought about before, Issei was static. The people, the motion of the ocean, and even the weather was static. The golden sunsets were beautiful, but they were rarely ever changing. It gets to the point where he wishes for the occasional rain, which for him was a symbol of change. It reminded him that Issei wasn't just a computer-generated town abandoned by its creator in a perfect state with its perfect sunsets, perfect location, perfect people, and perfect weather. And so he waits in participation for the first drop to fall. On Monday, it does not come. The breeze was still there. However, the sky's appearance was as, as sunny and beautiful as it always was. After school had ended, Izuku was watching Kotsky at the field with his teammates from outside of the chain link fence. Kotsky today was focused more on helping coach the others as the captain of the pole vault team for obvious reasons, and Izuku admired seeing how Kotsky coached the others. He was not a kind or an easy teacher. He didn't give baseless pra praise, but what he but he, what he was is effective. His advice was catered to each of his teammates' personal styles, which Kotsky had been observing under the radar for years. Just before he was about to leave, a fluffy head of brunette hair bounced towards him, and within a couple of seconds, Izuku looked up to see Kaido Sen standing on the other side of the gate, grinning down at him. Midoriya, the brunette called out to him. It's a beautiful day to see a beautiful person, isn't it? Azuku rolled his eyes with a smile. You really like to throw out compliments, don't you? Kaido shrugged. 
I'm just shooting my shot. Anyways, are you free tomorrow night? Azuki thinks about it. He's been on two other dates with Kaido since the first one, and they had gone to the movie theater and then a park another time. It was nice and had the same vibe as it did before. Sweet and safe. Azuki felt bad because he knew that he wanted someone else, but still, the hope that maybe another person who would want him back could sweep him, sweep him off of his feet and make him agree to a few more dates with Kaido. Izuku learns a couple of things about Kaido. First, the brunette didn't really like spontaneous things and would prefer if dates were planned out. Izuku was sure that Kaido had romanticized had a romanticized image of things in his head before it happens and wanted it to play out exactly how he plans it, which is fine since it ends up being fun. Secondly, Kaido enjoys certain parts of Izuku and not so much other parts. Kaido liked Izuku's face. The fact that Izuku was smart and involved in a lot of clubs, the way Izuku talked, and he liked Izuku's happy personality. But from what the Greenette noticed, Kaido didn't so much enjoy Izuku's strength, and it surprised him here and there when Kaido wanted to help him with something, just to find out Izuku could do it himself, carrying heavy things and the like. Kaido also didn't seem to like doing th what he considers to be slightly childish. No sneaking into places, no pushing each other in shopping carts around a parking lot, none of the sort. Kaido prefers adult-like dates that could still be fun, dinner in a movie, walks around a park, then ice cream, the classics. It was fine, Izuku tells himself. Thirdly, more than anything else, Kaido-sen hated Izuku's relationship to Bakugo Katsuki, and he made it known. On their second date, they had been sitting on a park bench when Kaido had asked him what he did last night. I climbed a water tower and watched the sunset, Azuku says casually while eating his ice cream. It was really nice. Kaido gives him a look then, and then asks, leaning back against the bench, Isn't that illegal? I mean, Azuku pursed his lips. It was a water tower that's been abandoned. No one really owns it or uses it anymore. You know that's dangerous, right? Kaido looks at him and plays with a lock of Azuku's hair. You don't know what's broken or not in an abandoned place since there's no one to maintain the facilities. You could get seriously hurt. The, familiar, the, f fam f <laughs> the familiarity of those words struck a chord and Izuku frowned. He knew that the sentiment was nice and out of concern, but he was also sick of being underestimated. If I get hurt, I'll take responsibility for my own actions, Izuku frowned, swinging his legs on the park bench. Nah, if anyone, Bakugo should take responsibility, Kaido said in a slightly bitter tone. He's always planning these stupid ideas in your head and making you go on these ridiculous Azuku defense himself. It's not stupid, and he doesn't make me do anything. Kaido, I want you to know that I don't just follow Kachin around like a loyal dog, and some of these ideas are mine. He's not the nicest person, but if there's something I don't want to do, he won't even think about it. He knows my capabilities. Kaido looked at him, then pursed his lips, glancing down at the ground. Sorry, I just get a little jealous. You're with him all the time. Jealous? Don't we all? Azuku thinks to himself, but just elbows the other. We're project partners. Kaido then looked at him as if he was stupid. Just project partners? Midoriya, we both know very well you two hang out much more than what's required. Azuku looked down at his lap. Kaido, me and Kachan's partnership is not any of your business, he said, wanting to end the conversation. It is if I want you to be my boyfriend. Kaido turns to him then. I'm going to be real with you. Midoriya, I don't want you hanging out with him. He's a shitty person, you know. Great coach, great athlete, whatever, but he's a bad person. Azuku gaped at him, unsure of what exactly to say to that. Kaido looked frustrated as he talked further. He's emotionally fucked in the head. All he cares about is Vault and winning everything. He can't take losing. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about anyone but himself. All of your es efforts are wasted on him, so I don't even know why you try. If you were my boyfriend, I wouldn't want you to hang out with someone like that. Azuka blinked up at Kaido. There's a moment of silence before he looks off to the side. That's why I'm not your boyfriend. Yet. Kaido said, unfazed, and went back to a more charming version of himself. You'll come around. 
The conversation that day had ended there and left Izuku with an uncomfortable feeling in his stomach at both the slander at Kotsky but also his views on Kaido. It was obvious that the boy was speaking out of jealousy. He knew that much. But Izuku knew that he and Kotsky weren't anything like that. Besides, even if he was Kaido's boyfriend, that still gave him no right to treat Izuku as if he owned him or to police who he can or cannot be friends with. He had enough policing in his life. And so, back to the moment, Kaido was standing on the other side of the fence, and Izuku thought back to that conversation during their last time hanging out. Smiling up at the athlete, Izuku shrugged. I'm not sure. Well, Kaido says then, if you're free, I'd like to take you to an art museum or something. Izuku is curious. There's no art museums near here. It's about a couple of hours away in a bigger city, Kaido explains. I don't know. I was thinking we could go there. Walk the museum, explore the city a little bit, grab dinner, maybe even book a hotel room for the night, and he gives Izuku a look. You know. Izuku knew all right. Kaido wasn't exactly shy about wanting him in that kind of intimate way, and although they've made out, usually at the end of their dates or played with each other's bodies for a little bit, Izuku has never thought of going all the way with Kaido. When Izuku thinks of his first time, he can't help but have an unrealistic image of someone who would never want him like that. And so, considering what Kaido was hinting at now, Azuka couldn't help but not feel entirely interested. Kaido continued, Your parents would let you go, right? Azuku wanted to laugh a bit. He said it so automatically that Azuku wonders if Kaido really knew him at all. If he really knew Azuku, he wouldn't have to ask such a question. It's just me and my mom, actually, Azuka corrected, and she definitely won't let me. Oh, my bad. Kaido looked apologetic. Well, I'm pretty busy the next week after tomorrow, but I could at least take you out for, to the county fair on next Wednesday. Ah, the county fair. Izuku forgot that that happened annually. He was usually allowed to go to the county fair as long as he got back early enough. It was just a big carnival and a fair event that happened on Ise Fairgrounds, and there was always good music, good food, and lots of cool rides that he probably was too old for. Thinking about it, Izuku tells Kaido, Sure. But I'll have to leave early. It's no problem. The athlete grinned. It's a date then. From behind Kaido, Izuku heard an all too familiar voice calling out to Kaido. No, it's fucking practice. Get your ass back to the pit. If I find you distracted again, I'll get you doing ten fucking laps with weighted vests. Izuku watched the blonde come up as a as if out of reflex, wanted to go up to Kotsky and strike up a conversation, dragging the other somewhere. And then he remembers. This was the big shot Kotsky, the celebrity athlete Kotsky, the one who says the minimum to him in school. Kaido huffed out some air and turned to Kotsky. So you can come over here whenever you want, but the moment I do it for 10 seconds, you're going to be like that, Bakugo? Kotsky stepped up a bit, and the difference in build and power between Kotsky and Kaido was very clear. Koski had four inches on him, more, muscul more muscle, a bulkier build, more of everything all around. To be fair, Kaido was a very toned, athletic, and big person, just not in comparison. And then the blonde athlete spoke near his teammate. Ask me that again when you're a three-time national youth champion, when your tournament record is 17-6, when your personal record is 17-10 and never lost a fucking tournament in your life, fuckface. Kaido was silent, because Kotsky was right. And the blonde knew it, because he sauntered forward with a nasty grin. That's right, now get back into the pit, get back into the pit and run your record. We're getting you to next inch by Friday. Kaido breathed out before stating a quick, yes, captain, and jogged off to the track field. That left the two of them, Izuku and Kotsky, standing there now with a slight air of awkwardness that usually wasn't there these days. Izuku made eye contact then with Kotsky with, for a split second to find the blonde's expression unreadable, his body language not revealing anything, and Kotsky says nothing either, before he turns and jogs back to the practice pit as well. Odd, Izuku thought to himself. Odd indeed. Kachan, do you like Issei? Izuku asks. As of current, it was a slow moving Tuesday evening, and Izuku had his head laid back on an empty pit. Kotsky, after, Kotsky, after practice had ended, had stolen Izuku off 
to go to the stadium where the next regionals tournament will be held. At the moment, it was completely empty, and Koski had to climb over a metal gate in order to get it unlocked and unlock it from the other side. However, when they made it inside the empty stadium, it left Azuku in awe. The outdoor stadium was about an hour or so from Issei, which wasn't too bad considering that it was a big tournament. It was a stage both Katsuki and Izuku had been to before. After all, the blonde competes every year, and the greenette watches every year. However, seeing it void of people gave off a completely different aura. Izuku was used to large crowds, boisterous activity, and blaring speakers everywhere. Seeing the stadium empty, quiet, and missing any sort of activity made the police made the place seem humongous. The stands were plentiful, and the track field looked larger than average. Even the pole vault bit pit seemed enormous, so much that Izuku couldn't fathom how Koski could fly as high as he did. The athlete hadn't taken him there to practice or anything. They had simply been driving with no actual destination in mind, just enjoying the conversation and the company over good music on the radio, when Koski swerved to pull in, into here. And here they were, an hour later, exploring the stadium and pretending that they were the king of the world, shouting to each other from the tallest bleachers across the stadium, and they were now simply laying on a landing zone at the pole vault pit, staring up at the open sky, heads nearly touching. Zuku watches the clouds move, and the classic golden Issei sun reflects off of it. In his right hand was an empty bottle of some carbonated yogurt drink, and on his left was snacking on some salmon roe onigari. The wind was a little bit more mild today. Crows perched itself on top of the pole vault bar, calling, at, calling to each other, and they'd heard the occasional sound of a car zoom by from outside of the stadium on the quiet highway. Koski raises a brow at the question. Why are you asking, nerd? Azuki gently elbows Koski in the side. I don't understand why you can't just answer my questions easily, Kachan. Koski snorts. Who would I be if I made it easy for you? A better person, Izuku rolls his eyes with a grin, but he thinks about it. He's always thought this about Kotsky, but never found a way to tell the other. It wasn't like any of their more lighthearted conversations or intense but enjoyable debates or a random tangent that they go on. This struck a little deeper. Izuku softly says then, I feel like... You were born and raised in a town too small for you to spread out your wings, like you've always been meant to be far away from here. Far, far away. Azuku reaches his hands to trace the clouds in the sky. Some are bigger and better than what Issei and our quiet streets could offer you. Better than what I could ever offer you, Azuku thought, but didn't say. Kotsky was quiet for a moment, seemingly contemplating Azuku's words. Azuki found this to be rather thoughtful and implied to him that the blonde was taking the, his statement with seriousness rather than teasing playfulness. I'm right where I need to be, Kotsky cryptically said. Caterpillars are stuck in their cocoons before they become butterflies, but those cocoons are necessary. They provide protection, warmth, a place to grow, but at some point you gotta break out and explore the world and shit, you know? Can't stay there forever. Azuki turns his head slightly to Koski, who was still looking up at the sky. You're a nerd too, you know. That just proved it. Koski threw a protein bar wrapper at Azuku. Shut it. I didn't know you could be so philosophical. Azuku laughed lightly. Hmm, so Issei's your cocoon and you're the caterpillar? Nah, Koski answers. It's not just me. Issei's your cocoon too. It's time to break out, nerd. Where are you going to college? Izuku finds it funny that in all their time together, the subject of university has never come up. He thinks it's because there's no point in asking about the other, or about Izuku at least. After all, they wouldn't be associating come the end of the semester. The thought terrified the greenette, and so he avoids it whenever possible. But now the question arises from the star athlete himself, and Izuku wished he had a more concrete and exciting answer. I, Izuku found himself struck. Don't know. My mom wants wants you to stay near. Kalski finishes for him. Could have fucking guessed. I should have asked where do you want to go to college. Izuku fidgeted with the hem of his shirt before sighing. I want to be in Tokyo. Their universities have the best sports medicine programs. 
It'd be nice to work in the sports industry, helping athletes figure out their best forms and techniques based on their bodies. I think it would match my interests and hobbies as well. Kotsky hummed. Have you applied? Azuki felt guilty. Yeah, to Waseda and the University of Tokyo. Did you get accepted? Kotsky asked. He felt more guilty. To Waseda, yeah. And let me guess, Kotsky chuckled. Auntie has no idea, and I bet you're thinking I'm passing up the fucking opportunity to make things easier on her, even though you hate the damn thought of rejecting it. Azuku bit his lip. It wouldn't be too bad. I could do a four-year nursing program at the college nearby and... And what? Kotsky pulls him up from a sitting position, gets stuck in her shitty underfunded clinic that barely has competent fucking surgeons. I'm sick of this conversation. You're so fucking complacent. This is why I fucking hate... And then Kotsky pauses, and then thinks about what he was about to say. And then Izuku lays there, looking up at the sitting athlete, waiting for the next words he was expecting to come out of the blonde's mouth. But after a moment, Kotsky's shoulders seemed to relax, and he settled back into a nonchalant mode. Izuku then pulled himself up to sit as well, and shuffles uncomfortable on the mat. How about you? Where are you going to go to college? Kotsky flicks the leaf off the landing mat. K.O. It's 24 minutes from Wasada. Azuki laughs bittersweetly. Why didn't you bother? Why did you bother telling me that? I don't. Want, you don't want to see my face again after this project ends. At this com- comment, the blonde looks away as if he just remembered. Tell me honestly, Deku. Our deal. Do you like it? Azuki's mouth gaped. Of all questions, Azuki most definitely did not expect this one. It was the very first time that Kotsky was so candid about the topic and wanted to know his opinion on it. Now that the opportunity arose, Izuku was terrified. He had never expected to be given the chance to reveal the truth. He wasn't sure if he should. Izuku fidget, fidgeting increases, but decided to be honest. No. Kotsky turns to him then and steps off the mat, reaching out to lift Izuku's chin up and look into those bright green eyes for a moment. Like I said, complacent. And then he let go immediately, turning around and taking a couple of steps towards the stretch of his limbs. Forwards to stretch his limbs. K.O. offered me a scholarship to be on their vault team, and I'm going to play club so I can qualify for nationals and the Olympic trials come another couple years. I'll be in the city for a while, more than a couple years, when I can't vault anymore. I'll settle back down in Ise. You want to come back? Izuku asks. Sure. Kossi says. Real question is, am I going to come back to find you in the exact same spot I left you? Left you. Izuku tries not to repeat the ending part of that sentence. What Koski said slapped him in the face harder than he needed it to. He imagines it then. Koski moving back to Issei in a couple of decades from now. Maybe married, maybe not. With plenty of stories to tell and sights he has seen. Would Izuku still be walking the same boulevards they roam through as teenagers? Hanging out by the same ice cream shops where sweets were getting a little numb on his aging tongue. Watching the newer generation go to the spring dance while reminiscing on his unconventional one and wondering to himself what the boy who swept him off his feet was doing in the city. The thought killed him. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Izuku barely whispers, eyes looking forlorn as he delves into the sadder part of his mind. Kotsky takes a breath. And it says, fine by me. The wind was picking up again, and it pushes the metal gates within its frame, sending its loud echo throughout the entire stadium, and Izuku just listens quietly to it. Katsuki stands there looking up at the bar he knew he was going to clear. Izuku turns his head up towards the sky. It'll be dark soon, Izuku notices. I heard there was going to be a meteor shower sometime between tonight and next Thursday. Katsuki nods. It's not going to be tonight. I heard it's going to come next Wednesday. Why? You want to make a wish on a shooting star or something? Azuki smiles. Maybe. You won't find any tonight, then. Kasi turns towards him. But I know another place you can make a wish. Azuku tilted his head. Yes? Have you ever been to the Cliff of Wishes? Kasi asks, bending down to pull up some turf. Azuku knew of it. Almost all the students and Even adults in Issei had been there at some point in their life. It was almost like a town tradition, a little outside of Issei, up towards the mountains, 
there's a rock cliff off the side of the road and it just it, it juts out pretty far so cars could actually drive on it. Most people park and the tradition is to throw a rock off the cliff while making a wish. The rock will carry the wish down to the mountain god who will grant your wish. It was an odd tradition, but one of the one most people have participated in. No, Azuku shook his head. Have you? Kasi shook his head. Nah. Do you want to go? Azuku asked, swinging his legs above the mat. Kotsky saunters over, picks up his keys off the mat, and shrugs. Sure. The drive to the Cliff of Wishes wasn't too horrible. It was still a bit of a drive, since they had to go up the mountain near Issei and take the sharp incline that led to the rock cliff. The sun set bes- behind them, and Izuku enjoys the wind blowing through his hair as they whipped up the mountainside. Izuku could tell Kotsky liked the incline, considering the boy loved to hike. The cliff was obvious when they arrived, since it jutted out from the side of the mountain, and there were tire marks from other cars having been there. When Kotsky pulled off the side of the road to drive on the rock, the sky was just about dark. Just a couple more minutes, and it would be completely night. Already, Izuku could see stars in the moon. The ground was full of rocks and pebbles, perfect for throwing off the cliff. The greenette stepped out of the car once they parked, and slowly he sauntered over towards the edge of the cliff. He didn't go far enough, though, so that, he, that, so that something could accidentally happen and make him fall off. The wide cliff that jutted out overlooked all of Issei, some of the surrounding land, and had a gorgeous, gorgeous view of the ocean beyond their small town. It was absolutely beautiful, and Izuku turned to look at Kotsky with smiling eyes. Kachan, look at the view, Izuku excitedly pointed. Kasi seemed to let out a grin at this, and ruffled the shorter boy's hair. It ain't bad. Then, Izuku began to squint while pointing out things. There's my house, and there's yours. There's Lake en- Enid, and there's that junkyard. There's no way you can fucking see our exact houses from here, Kotsky frowned. Oh, I can't, Izuku laughs. I'm genera- generalizing the area. And for a little while, they both stand up there and point things out, or at least where they thought things were. Izuku finds it crazy how many more places he knew now because of Kotsky. Finally, Izuku bends down to pick up a mid-sized pebble and holds it in his palms. He looks out onto the view and he thinks. He knew not to say it out loud because of the stereotype. He could feel Kotsky's eyes watching him. He knew what he wanted to wish for. Closing his eyes and thinking about it, Izuku steps back and throws the rock off the cliff. The entire time it goes down, Izuku could hear the clanking as the rock continues to hit more rock, before the dirt muffles out the sound in the forest below. I made a stupid wish, Izuku holds his cheeks in embarrassment. Kosuke raises a brow. What was it? I can't tell you, Izuku frowned, then noticed Kosuke wasn't making a move. Are you not making a wish? The blonde in question shook his head. I don't have any wishes. Izuku looks at him funny. None? How does a person not have wishes? You could wish to win nationals, you know. If I win nationals, there's no way in hell I'm sharing the credits to some wish cliff. Kotsky rolls his eyes, and it'll be all me, and only me. Very Kachan of you, Izuku notes. Suit yourself. You don't have any other wishes? Kotsky sighed, voice devoid of emotion, and shrugged. No. Izuku felt like there was something off about that response, but leaves it anyways with an okay, sitting near the edge of the cliff with the moonlight so beautifully illuminating the city and the rock beneath them. Izuku is happy enough for now. It is a beautiful day, one that he will stockpile into his memories. It was an unassuming Thursday when it decided to finally rain in Issei. It had began while Izuku was in class. The teacher's voice droned on about something Izuku already studied to death the other night with Kotsky, sitting nearby, bothering him the entire time. He was daydreaming about some fake scenario with the two of his favorite comic characters that he shipped, wondering what headcanon he could come up with when he heard it first. The pitter-pattering of droplets on the window sill of his classroom, the gentle taps hit the glass and slid down in funny lines and Izuku's eyes widen as he stares at its trajectory. It was his first rain of the season, and it felt as if he's been waiting for a while. The clouds were finally dark and powerful. Soon enough, he'll expect to hear the boom of thunder and bright flashes of lightning. But as of now, the rain was calm, 
and he could see the black asphalt roads begin to soak up the long-awaited rainwater. Issei was pretty, plenty humid, and the ocean nearby made all the plants look tropical, but rain only came now. He sat in his classroom, but wondered what the sensation of the crying sky on his fingertips felt like. He always found rain to be a sign of a transition, at least in Issei. As his days progresses, the rain increases in intensity. The soft pattern had a turn and fast pour that they can even hear from inside the windowless rooms. The storm drains were working hard to swallow up all the water so it didn't flood the streets. And when the school day ends, Azuku stands under the awning of the school, wondering what he should do. His mother had told him to pack an umbrella this morning, and Azuku had already told her that he had one stowed in his backpack, only to realize it wasn't there. He could text her and ask her to pick him up. Yeah, that's what he'll probably do. His feet were already a little wet from the wind blowing in some water. He stares out in the hazy atmosphere, blanketed in rain, and out onto the track field a bit of a distance away. It was solo practice, and practically speaking, Kotsky shouldn't be there, but he was there, with the pole gripped in his hand and wet clothes matted tightly to his body. Kotsky's hair was dripping ridiculously, and he had to stop and wipe the water off of his eyebrows so that it wouldn't fall into his eyes while he vaulted. Azuku was floored by the dedication, and even though it didn't seem practical to pole vault in the rain when the track field was slick, the pole was slippery, and the landing pit was collecting water, but evidently Kotsky did not care. Because Azuku watches from far away under the awning as Kotsky repeats his runs over and over again. Azuka could barely hear anything over the sound of rain and occasional thunder. His books were clutched in his arms and he temporarily took off his backpack to place them in and set it up against the concrete flooring as he digs into his pocket for his phone to text his mother. He types out a message and was about to press send when he heard the dropping of a pole. He tilted his head up and over to the truck field to see Kotsky had his left pole on the ground and was now looking over to Azuku from a distance, running a hand through his wet hair. Azuku makes eye contact. He shyly waves. Kotsky does not wave back, but instead the blonde starts jogging lightly towards the gate and leaves the field. Once he gets about 100 feet away, he slows down to a walk, and his steps on the asphalt make splashes in the puddles. Azuku still stands there dry and watching the other walk towards him. When Kotsky was just a couple feet away, Azuku admires the way the rain glistens off his skin and the slightly out-of-breath look the athlete had. Kotsky simply stood for a moment, staring down at the shorter boy, seeming as if there was something he wanted to do. He didn't say anything, so Azuku didn't either. There was just a space of silence in between them, filtered out by the loud rain. Finally, the blonde reaches out a hand, dripping with water that ran down his forearm, and Azuku stares at it. It was extended out towards him, similar to what Kotsky had done when he asked Azuku to dance. However, this was no dance. Yet, Kosky's arm r- reached out, waiting for his, soaking under, pouring, under the pouring sky, with beads of water dripping off his fingertips. Kosky's eyes were fierce, as they usually were, and Izuku couldn't see the, them waver in the slightest. Izuku doesn't know how long he stands there in the warm confines of the awning, mostly dry, perfectly content with the comforts that his protection over his head provided him. He stares at the turbulence that would be sure to come the moment he steps out and takes Kotsky's hand. The wind, the rain, the uncertainties, the lightning, the dangers, and then the most turbulent factor of all, Kotsky himself. And yet, Azuku hesitantly reaches out. His hands feel it at first, the initial couple of droplets of rain that immediately soaked the sleeve of his shirt, and it was warmer than Azuku had expected it to be. How nice. The first rain of the season was a warm one. When Azuku's hand meets Kotsky, the blonde pulls their grip. Clo- pu- the blonde closed their grip and pulled Azuku forward, lurching the green net until Azuku went from completely dry to soaked within seconds. The warm rain immediately matted his hair to his forehead, and Azuku looked up at Kotsky through rain-dripped hair. His shirt was getting stuck to his body, and the hold on his hand was still secure. Kachan? Azuku asked softly barely enough to hear over the rain. The sky was a deep greenish blue, even though it was still just 4 p.m., and the clouds completely covered the sky. The boy in question met Azuku's green eyes with his ruby ones. 
Daku. Izuku used his other hand to brush off water off his eyelids. What are we doing out in the rain? You know it's thundering, right? Kasi lets go of his hand then, then steps back, tilting his head up towards the sky and spreading his arms out while grinning. I'm aware. Azuki laughed, pulling out his matted shirt. If I get struck down by lightning, I hope I'll at least gain some superpowers. Kasuki smirks at this, then looks off to the side before turning back to Azuku. Have you ever been swimming in the rain? Azuku was quick to answer. I haven't. Azuku grins, or Kasuki grins at this response. Say less, nerd. Kasuki ben- begins jogging in the direction of the beach, and Azuku has to yell out from behind him to wait for him. He had stopped to take out his phone and text his mother a quick, I'll be home a little late, around 10 or so, and jogs after Kotsky. The beach was about a 20-minute walk from Issei High, and so they were jogging. It wouldn't be too bad at all, but still, trying to run through the streets and sidewalks of Issei in the pouring rain was hard, considering their feet could hydroplane, and yet Izuku had a fun time laughing as he follows Kotsky quickly through the neighborhood streets around the corner store and down a shaded path until they reached the wet sand. Because it had been raining all day, the sand was thick and matted, instead of the usual baby powder white they normally were. In the distance, they could barely see too far out because the fast winds and thick blankets of rain and clouds covered up anything they could possibly see. And yet, that was the fun of it. Azuka and Koski were the only two fools stupid enough to be out on the beach in this weather voluntarily. Koski hadn't even finished practice yet, for all Azuku knew. Since their clothes were both soaked, there was no need to strip down, and so both boys ran towards the ocean and immediately jumped in, fully clothed and ready to mess around for a while. The ocean water was cold compared to the warmth of the rain. Seeing the rainfall hit the ocean surface in tiny little dot patterns excited him and with Koski swimming next to his side, Izuku felt ridiculously happy and unconcerned with just about anything else. Every other memory in the world can go to hell. They played stupid water games and just swam out far to tread water and talk. However, it was harder to talk when the waves were rougher than usual, and salt water continuously got up their nostrils and in their mouths. Izuku would smile water if he could. So, I guess the rain means that Goshi isn't hosting that party anymore. Izuku asked, patting the water out far. He wasn't going to it, he just knew that Gashi, one of their mutual classmates, throws a huge party every year that Kosuke always went to, and this year it was scheduled for tonight. But with the rain happening, Izuku was sure there wasn't going to be a lot of people showing, considering the weather. Not everyone had the guts to go out in the rain like this. I wouldn't know, Kosuke rolled his eyes. I wasn't going anyways. Izuku gives him a funny look. You weren't? Why? Did something happen? Nothing happened, Kotsky shrugged. I just don't feel like going this year. Izuku takes this into consideration. Lately, some word here and there had been going around the school about Bakugo Kotsky and Izuku. Being who he was, couldn't help but listen and notice. Flutters of conversation throughout the school were were proclaiming that the all-star athlete just hadn't been very active in parties or anything else lately. In fact, he hasn't attended social events since the dance, and even then, the blonde left halfway through to go who knows where. And it wasn't as if suddenly he had turned into a social shell, for he was still generally the same person within school, except a bit more off. Without seeming to know it himself, Bakugo Kotsky has picked up weird slang or sayings and would occasionally go off on little tangents without stopping himself until halfway. He would still curse like a sailor, but the mean remarks had toned down a tiny bit. If anything, it made people more obsessed with him, made him feel more attainable. And yet, Izuku realized just then, Kotsky has not slept with anyone, in what seemed to be a long time. If he had, Izuku would have known since the shit spreads everywhere, and quickly too. If he had, then Izuku would have wondered where in his schedule did he find the time in between spending much of his days with the Zuku and intensely practicing pole vault, even outside of practice hours. This realization made Izuku's heart go crazier than it needed to. False hope seeped in through his skin, and he was quick to try and kick it out, because he didn't need that for his mental stability. Pining hopelessly for the boy was enough, but if Izuku were to add in the element of what if, it could ruin him. 
After all, just because Koski hadn't slept with anyone for a while didn't mean anything aside from the fact that the blonde was extremely busy. Still, he was curious, and that curiosity persisted for a while. The two swam in the beach some more, constantly having to wipe away both of the salt water of the ocean and the fresh water of the rain from their faces. The waves were getting rough because of the wind, which made them come in from all directions, essentially tossing both Izuku and Katsuki around like a doll in the water. Ultimately, it became more of a hazard to stay in, so the two climbed out of the water when the sky began to darken further. It should be about six o'clock right then, and if Izuku was correct, that meant the sun will begin to set behind the massive vat of clouds that covered it. The fun was far from over. The boys ran through the sand, picking it up to their feet in big, matted clumps. Koski grabbed his pill speaker from the shore, and they ran to a small awning at the edge of a closed-down beachside bar, where it was dry. Izuku's teeth chattered, going from being submerged in water to the windy surface air, and he held himself to keep warm. Koski was jogging in place to do the same, but put on a song, Against All Odds, by Phil Collins. Once he put on the slower, more sentimental song, Koski shoved his phone in his wet pocket and turns towards Izuku. They looked at each other for a moment before Izuku grinned at him with a small laugh at how stupid they were as a default state when together. Koski ended up laughing a bit too and reached a hand over to ruffle Izuku's wet hair. And then they ran off back into the rain, since it was warmer than standing in the dryness allowing the wind to hit their clothes. The thunder above was constantly booming, and the darkish greenish blue tint was getting even more deep as the sky loses its light, and the boys ended up near an empty white warehouse on the side of the road with a parking lot that had too many potholes in it. When the city street lamps turned on, Izuku and Koski were jumping into potholes and kicking up water at each other. Izuku had strong legs, so his splashes easily soaked the athlete, who would sometimes push him into larger potholes, soaking his entire body in warm gravel water that was probably really dirty. It was in dumb moments like this, like these that seem meaningless where Izuku finds the most joy. If anyone were to ask, saying that he spent the evening jumping and splashing around in potholes near an empty warehouse was not the most interesting thing to describe, but he felt like this was truly living. And looking at the smile on Kotsky's face that he fails to hide, the blonde must think so too. When the rain when the rain begins to slowly pass over them and the fall isn't as heavy, the two of them walk on the empty Issei roads with their sneakers squishing from the water inside of the fabric back to the school parking lot. It was a slow walk and now that the rain was beginning to clear, they could hear each other's conversations better. Azuku's cheeks for the 15th time hurt from smiling so much, but what could he do but accept it? He was happy. It was dark at this point, with only white street lamps to lighten up the asphalt road with water. Occasionally a car would whiz by and Kotsky could pull him in by the waist into the road so that he didn't get ran over, and the gentle contact flushed Izuku's cheeks. When they began, when they got back to the parking lot, the rain had completely stopped, but the clouds were still plentiful above, which told them that the rain would begin again soon, maybe in a couple hours, possibly two, but for now it was quiet aside from the dripping of residual water off of the roofs of the school building. Koski had even turned the music off. You haven't really been with anyone for a while either. At this from the side, Koski raises a brow and turns his head slightly towards Izuku, who notices but refuses to make eye contact. You keeping track or something? Koski asks him. Izuku shook his head. No, like I've told you before, word gets around. I know practically everyone you do. It hurt to say. Koski considers this, and his vo co voice comes out low when he mutters, Everyone, huh? Yeah, Azuku feels breathless when he says it, and now he wishes that he never brought the conversation up, because the pang of hurt and jealousy were beginning to arise within his chest. He wanted the boy next to him so badly, he realized that it hurt to be here just a couple inches away, but not have him in a way that others have had him before. Koski shifts in his spot, but shrugs. I don't know. Are you... Izuku thinks of the right word. Frustrated? He plays with the rocks more. Koski chuckles. Yeah, like crazy. Fucking frustrated as hell. 
but I haven't done shit. Why don't you? Izuku was quick to say. This question made Katsuki pause a little, and Izuku waits for his answer, wondering if it will come at all. He pretends to be casual about it, but Izuku's mind was racing to know. When the athlete answers, he does so in an odd tone. I got places I'd rather be. Izuku's heart fluttered at this statement, because although it could be literal, Izuku wanted to feel more than anything that Kotsky had meant that he'd rather go out and do things with him to play in the rain, swim in the ocean during a storm, splash around in potholes. He wanted to think these kinds of things meant more to Kotsky than some one-night stands, and Kotsky's statement just now more or less confirmed him. Izuku felt a rush of dopamine and wanted to hug the other so badly, but he knew that the other was just wasn't was just not that type of person. And so Azuku just plays it off casually. Like at a warehouse pushing me into potholes? Kotsky half grins. Exactly, nerd. Like pushing creepy eyed nerds into hot potholes. Azuku frowns. Why do you always say that? Kotsky rolls his eyes. Because it's true. Oh. Azuku couldn't help but feel slightly insecure. All of his life, he's had mixed feelings on his eyes. They were so round, so large, and fem feminine looking, but most of all, incredibly expressive. No matter what he tried to hide, his true emotions would show up in them. Anyone can tell when he was happy, when he was sad, just by looking at them. He had sketchy people and kind people alike tell them they're gorgeous and doe-like. Kotsky was the only one who thought differently. And he knew one person's opinion shouldn't matter, but it was Kotsky. Kotsky sits up, and Izuku follows suit, bringing his knees up to his chest. It's almost nine. We should get go we should get going back before your mom bitches. Kotsky mutters. Just a few more minutes, Izuku says, opting to look at the ground next to him. My clothes are almost dry. All right, Kotsky says before adding on. Nerd, when do your badminton matches start? Izuku plays with the gravel. Um, the first week of your summer break, I'm pretty sure. The first week of summer break, I'm pretty sure. And then Izuku laughs with bitterness in his tone. Why? Did you plan on coming to see me? After the project ends? Don't ask things you don't actually care about, Kachan. Izuku couldn't help but come off a bit salty. He was living a perfect life right now, aside from everything that was going on with his mom. He was happier than ever before while more conflicted than he's ever been, because he knew that the happiness with Kotsky was on a, down, on a downward tra trajectory, bound to end up in a heap, a heap of heartbreak. He was on a smooth sailing carriage to his do doom, it felt like. Oi, Kotsky's voice sounded more serious. What the fuck is up with you? Izuku's brows furrowed, and he bit the inside of his cheek. He took a deep breath and attempted to let go of the frustrated, upset feelings plaguing him. He wasn't supposed to get angry or upset. That was never productive, so he tried to let it go. It's nothing, Kachan. No. Look at me, you fucking nerd, Kasi tells him from the side. Izuku shakes his head, not wanting to, and his fingers dig into the asphalt just to have something to do. He whispered out in, I don't want to. And why the hell not? Kasi's voice was getting impatient. Look at me, damn it. Izuku's lips felt like trembling, but he held himself together. It wasn't a big deal, and he's had a great evening. There was no need to ruin it now. Izuku just shakes his head again and says no. Kotsky reaches out for his face, and Izuku sees the hand incoming, but the green at feeling the pressure inside of him build up without his permission slaps it away. Don't touch me! Kotsky's eyes widen, and Izuku sees in his peripheral vision. The hand re retracted, and Izuki's voice seemed to waver as he says, You... He felt his breath hitch as he tries to keep his tone steady. I don't want to look at you. You don't like my... He looks down at the ground again while slightly pained with a slightly pained expression that he wanted so desperately to hide. My eyes. Koski was silent for a moment, and Izuku did wonder what was going on through the boy's mind. The crickets seemed to chirp louder as their uncomfortable silence continued, and Izuku waits for any kind of response, but ultimately, but ult was ultimately okay if the conversation ended there. Finally, Kotsky stood up and said with a frustrated tone, For fuck's sake, you're not going to look at me because I don't- He runs an irritated hand through his hair. Fuck, are you shitting me, Deku? Azuku's brows stayed furrowed. You say it all the time! 
Katsuki then kneels in front of him and uses both of his hands to grip on the sides of Izuku's face and tilt it towards him, practically forcing the smaller to look at him. Izuku's eyes widen as they met Katsuki's gorgeous and dark red eyes once more, hating how they never cease to make his chest pound. Who fucking cares, nerd? Katsuki growls. Look at me when you speak to me. Izuku tries to tug Katsuki's hand away to no avail, and frustratedly says, First, you don't want me to look at you with my creepy ass eyes. Now you're telling me to look at you. Kachan, you're a mess, and you don't know what you want. Yeah? And you know exactly what you want. And you don't do shit about it. And let people like me step all over you. You fucking piece of shit. Katsuki tells him straight. Azuku wanted to cry, and his fingers pried at Katsuki's hands. What does that even mean? How much longer are you going to let people tell you what to do and how to feel about yourself and your life, huh? Katsuki pressures him. How much shit are you going to take from me? From your mom? From everyone else? Bastard. And then Katsuki lets go, standing back up. Izuku touches his cheeks and then stares at Katsuki angrily, even though he tried to hide it in his tone and got up to his feet. That's none of your biz, Izuku began, not actually having a good response. For fuck's sake, Katsuki threw his hands up in the air. You wouldn't even fucking look at me because I had a damn opinion on your eyes. Izuku wanted to control himself. He wanted to not get angry or upset, but it was hard when Katsuki, the instigator of it all, was standing right there. Before he could hold back, Izuku tells Katsuki, Not everyone is emotionally fucked up in the head, Kachan. And then, silence. God, it was silent. Koski's eyes widened for a split second before he went back to neutral. Izuku felt immediately guilty. He knew where he had gotten that statement from. Kaido had said it a couple days prior, and the statement glued itself into Izuku's mind until now. Izuku knew he took it a bit far. It was true, but Izuku also wanted Koski to know that he was still there for the other, that he was willing to be patient with the time they had left, but when Izuku let it out, it seemed aggressive. Finally, the blonde stepped forward while clapping his hand slowly. Izuku moved back as the taller boys continued clapping out loud. Katsuki let out an amused laugh. There it fucking is. There it is. Good fucking job, Daku. You said it. I'm sorry, Izuku scrambled to apologize, and there was guilt in his eyes. I didn't mean it like that. Katsuki interrupted him with a wild grin. Oh, you meant it, all right. But I really want to hear more, Deku. Tell me about how I'm emotionally fucked up in the head. Izuku shook his head while stepping backwards. Kachan, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. It was rude and out of... Katsuki interrupted him again. Jesus fucking Christ. And threw up his hands once more. It's always one step forward and two's Steps backward with you, ain't it, you prick? Izuku was confused. What? He didn't understand. What do you mean? So you finally get some fucking guts to tell me how you really feel about me. And now, you're gonna back to your shitty ass apologize for everything mode, as expected from you. I don't know what you want me to do. Izuku was feeling frustrated, frustration pull up again. I told you I want you to... I told you what I want you to do, Deku. Kasi laughs at him, even though nothing was funny. Tell me more. No, Izuku shakes his head, not understanding why Koski wanted him to. I, I don't want to. I can't. Koski takes this into consideration, then nods his head, looking off to the side like he was pondering over something, before turning back to Izuku. This is why I fucking hate you, you know? Izuku's eyes widened. There was a bit of silence as he lets Kotsuki's words that seemed random sink in. This topic has only been brushed aside before, never addressed, and now that it was here, Izuku couldn't connect the dots. He stands on the warm black asphalt asphalt with his parking lot lights shining faintly down, looking at the boy across from him. You hate me because I won't tell you why you're emotionally damaged? Izuku couldn't bring himself to finish the sentence. No, Koski rolled his eyes. How do you manage to miss the point every damn time, Deku? Fuck, you're so clueless it pisses me off. Because you never say anything straight up, Kachan. Izuku stepped forward, feeling anger he hated to feel pile up. You give me cryptic little statements and will never say anything other than what you mean. How am I supposed to know what you're trying to tell me if you do everything but tell me? You're not fucking dumb. 
You should be able to figure it out yourself. Kotsky snaps at him. Azuku looks at him as if he was insane, then laughs. You're actually ridiculous. Figure it out myself? You act like you're so easy to read. Figure it out myself. Is that what you expected me to do when I was fucking five and I lost the first friend I've ever made and you began to harass me? Izuku practically yells without thinking twice. Figure it out myself. Why you hate me so much? Kosuke dryly laughs. I was wondering when you'll fucking talk about that. Or are we going to ignore the fact that I made your life a living hell for years? Because honestly, I wouldn't be surprised. The humidity in the air was unbearable. Izuku looks to the side. I didn't think you'd want to talk about it. What? So you're just going to let me live the rest of my cushy life without facing the consequences of everything I've done? Koski gives him an amused but angry look. Well, if you haven't noticed, Izuku shoots him a glare, you don't handle things very well. You obviously think so fucking little of me. Koski steps forward, squaring Izuku up. Kachan, you hate it when I say anything nice to you, when anyone says anything sweet to you. Izuku argues with him. When we were at the d diner and Hana said you were so helpful, you looked uncomfortable. When I tried to ask about your feelings on anything, you look uncomfortable. Izuku's voice escalated with every sentence. When you feel frustrated and nervous at practice, you make sure you hide it and let nobody know. Why? Because your emotions make you uncomfortable. Shut up, Koski tells him. See? Izuku laughs arrow angrily. You're doing it right now, too. And when you feel surprised, or when something makes you upset, or really happy, you let it show on your face for just a second, just enough for me to catch it, before you cover it up, to make it look like you don't feel anything. Why? Because your emotions make you fucking uncomfortable. You can't even hug your own grandfather in front of me because you're uncomfortable. Izuku steps forward with pleading in his eyes, and Izuku's eyes are as watery as he looks down his, at his hands, trying not to let his voice crack. And, and I don't know why, because, because I like seeing it, Kachan. He wiped away the water threatening to spill from his ducks. I like seeing you happy or surprised or in awe, and I like being there for you when you're nervous or scared or I don't fucking need you to do shit for me. Koski turns away, and Izuku steps forward to grab for Koski's arm, who pulls back. But you want me to, Kachan. I don't want shit from you. Koski looks at him angrily. Izuku was tearing up again, much to his dismay. I know it's hard for you, Kachan. I know the pressure you feel is heavy, and that people have expectations for you. I know that everyone wants you to be a certain way, but I promise I won't ever want anything from you other than your friendship. I don't need you to be the super athlete Bakugo Kotsky. I don't need you to break any records or win nationals. I just need you. You fucking say that, but when I don't, you'll react the same as the rest of them. Kotsky steps forward and points at Azuku's chest. The tension was high. The more people who fucking care about me is the more who have the ability to be disappointed. And there's nothing I hate more than seeing that look in people's eyes. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I don't need you to fucking do shit for me. I'm fine on my own. Izuku was crying at this point, almost desperately pleading for Kotsky to listen to him. And his hands were on the sleeve of Kotsky's shirt, to which the blonde shoved off. The people who care about you, you won't ever feel disappointment in you, Kachan. We'll support you no matter what. It's okay to feel... God, shut the fuck up, Kotsky tells him angrily. I fucking bullied you, and now you're here trying to give me life advice? Azuku pursed his lips and held Kotsky's angry, angry eye contact. He shouldn't say it. He definitely shouldn't, but he does it anyways. Starting with a cracked but normal tone, Azuku increases his volume slowly as he speaks. You know what I think, Kachan? I think you're insecure. I think you're guilty. But you don't even know how to apologize. Why else would you constantly bring that up? Kotsky looked at him with angry eyes. But Izuku continued, Kachan, you took away a lot of my happy days when we were little. That's true. Izuku bit his lip to stop his tears, and he took a moment to collect himself. But you've given me so many more. Every time I watch you jump a little bit after class every day, I feel like I've been motivated. Every time you take me out, I feel like I regained a day that I've lost sitting at home wishing I could be anywhere else but here. Every time you make sure I eat or make sure I sleep on time or do something nice to me even though 
You have excuses for doing so. I feel like I'm being cared for. Kachun, you're so much more than your past. You're insecure about how people view you, and that's why you close yourself off. Because you think that if you convince yourself that you don't care, then it won't matter what they think. Koski stares at him then, both angry and surprised and Izuku doesn't break his gaze. He was slightly out of breath, but he needed to tell Koski that. He needed the other to know that although Koski was opaque, that there were still some parts that Izuku could see through. Koski finally replied, and it was still as frustrating to hear as ever. Great. So you've developed fucking Stockholm Syndrome. Izuku wanted to yell, so he just gripped his hair out of irritation and shoved Koski away. Can't you take anything seriously? You know what I fucking meant. You can't just play it off as a joke. Talk to me, Kachan. I need you to talk to me. Izuku cried. What is there to say? Kotsky spat out. You fucking got it. Ding, ding, ding. You want a damn prize or something? I have fucking issues. I don't know how to accept happiness. I don't know how to fucking lose. I'm deadly afraid of it. I don't know how to be a normal fucking human being. What is there more to even say? Kotsky doesn't even limit how much he curses. That you'll try. That you know it's unhealthy to be like this, Izuku begged. That you'll let me help. I've lived 18 fucking years, and I'd say I'm pretty damn good at the game. I don't need to. Katsuki out of habit began to defend himself again. Izuku wanted to punch the other, but held back. Instead, he practically shouted, shoving Katsuki again. You think you're fine, Kachan? You can't even admit that we're friends. We spend all of our free time together. You bring me to bed when I fall asleep on the floor. You tell me everything that annoys you or that interests you. And yet, you don't ever talk to me at school. You've never accepted something kind of said about you easily. And you have never even admitted we're friends. You're a coward, Bakako Kotsky. You're a coward and you're so closed off you don't know what's good for you anymore. You think I'm emotionally closed off? Kotsky shoved him back, pissed off. Real fucking funny. Sure, I'll admit it. I have issues. You got it, Deku. I can't tell real kindness from fake shit. Sure, whatever. But you think that I'm the one who's emotionally closed off. Izuku stepped backwards as Kasi moved forwards. And there was barely any space between them. But Izuku stood his ground. What are you trying to say? You're just as fucked up as I am, Deku. Kotsi grins menacingly, both pain, anger, and amusement in his deep eyes. Kachan, Izuku laughs. I don't have a problem being happy. Maybe not. Kotsky shakes his head in agreement. But you sure do have a problem with being angry, being sad, being anything that isn't perfect, happy-go-lucky son of a bitch. Izuku squinted at him. There's nothing wrong with that. Being angry doesn't ever solve anything. Are you sure about that? Kotsky spoke as if he knew something Izuku didn't. It sure doesn't fix anything either, though, don't you think? Kachan, I don't get the point. What does this have to do with any... Izuku felt as if they were too close, and the tension between them heated up after the rain air more than it already was. You're you're so complacent with your own mistreatment, it makes me sick, Katsuki tells him. Izuku was beyond stifled. He felt like they were both saying words, but none of them were stringing together. Katsuki was just throwing out some sentences that made to... That seemed to make sense to the blonde, but none to him. Their communication was on different pages, that it made it difficult to sink minds. Koski never wanted to say what he meant, while Izuku couldn't pick up hints. Seeing how unproductive and straight-up aggressive their conversation was, Izuku huffed and turned away, wanting to go home. He'll walk if he needed to. His heart was heavy, and Izuku just wanted to go home and cry. This is getting nowhere, Izuku tells him. Until you can tell me in real words and not cryptic statements, I'm going home. Izuku walked towards the awning where he had just left his backpack earlier, meaning to go pick it up and head back home. His mind was racing with too many thoughts that he couldn't even pinpoint one string of reasoning from another. All he knew was that he was confused at how this argument started, where it was going, and how it was ending. This was the first real argument that they've had in a long, long time, and that weighed heavily on Izuku's shoulders as he turned away from Kotsky, who stood there illuminated by the white street light and clothes still damp. When Izuku gets about three meters away, Kotsky then speaks up, with yet again another enigmatic statement. Do you remember the day you broke my Endeavor figure? Kotsky asked, voice quiet amidst the natural sound of Issei. Izuku slowed to a stop and swiveled around to his side, confused but looks at Kotsky. He thinks about it and shuffles through his memories before revealing, barely. 
It wasn't a detail that Izuka really thought much about. It was as if someone asked him what he did in the afternoon on a warm summer day ten years ago. It was a hazy memory, but Izuku knew something of the sort happened. He had been messing around with Kotsky's toys when something had happened, and he didn't remember too much of what happened afterwards other than small arguments ensued. You were in my backyard, five years old. And stupid kids, Kotsky says, not looking at Izuku. That was the day I decided I fucking can't stand you. Izuku felt water well up again, and he hated how easily he teared up. That day? Over something that small? Izuku had expected all this time that the reason why Kotsky hated him so much was some extravagant event, and his friends and the others of Issei who knew of their terrible relationship in the past thought so too. It must have been something huge, something worth all the years of teasing and harassment. Maybe Izuku had found out something about the other, which the taller bullied him to keep secret. Maybe Kotsky knew something about Izuku he really didn't like, but whatever it was, Izuku had never expected something so small. But to know it was over a broken toy killed Izuku even more. He didn't understand. Over a broken toy? Izuku's voice was tiny, and there were small streams sliding down his cheeks that he was quick to wipe away. Over a stupid broken toy? He cried. Kotsky still didn't look at him. I came in to get a drink for just a couple minutes. Meanwhile, you were messing with the toys I brought outside, and you ended up breaking off the arms of my Endeavor figure. Izuku's shoulders were shaking, and he silently stood there listening. I barely gave a shit about that figure, but I was a little bitch. Even when I was a small brat, I was an asshole. An overdramatic asshole with fucking anger issues. And so, I hit you. Koski spat out quietly. It's the first time I ever hit you. Izuku looked up, eyes bright, eyes a bit red and glanced over to where Kotsky stood, not looking at him. It, was a, it wasn't a small tap either. I hit you and I shoved you back into the dirt. You got a cut from your leg from falling on a stick and a bruise on your jaw. I was a fucking shitty kid. Kotsky laughed dryly. But you know what you did? Izuku listened, slowly recalling the event that didn't really mean much to him personally before tonight. Nothing. Absolutely fucking nothing. Kotsky sounded angry. You got up and you smiled at me and said it was fucking okay and apologized for breaking the figure. After I hit you and shoved you to the ground and when auntie came to pick you up, you told her that you just fell. Azuki's lip quivered and he played with his fingers. It wasn't a big deal. Kotsky snorted at this but looked both angry and pained at the same time. Wasn't a big deal. He repeated once more. Wasn't a big deal? Deku, this is exactly what I fucking meant. I hit you. I fucking hurt you. And instead of getting angry, instead of getting justice for yourself, you shoved it off and said it was okay. But I'm not fucking dumb, Deku. I saw it in those big eyes of yours that reveal absolutely everything. Kosuke's knuckles were white from clenching his fists. You were hurt and disappointed, just to hide it away a second later with that careless smile. You say I hide everything with a blank face, but you hide everything with a smile. If you ask me, that's even more shitty. Izuku shook his head, not wanting to hear any more. He knew his eyes were getting puffy. Kachum, stop. You're so stupid I don't want to have the blonde didn't. I hated you because you were fucking pathetic, weak. And maybe it was fucking stupid what happened, but you never proved me wrong. Everything you did after that point only proved it. Every time I hurt you, every time I said something fucking shitty to you, every time I shoved you away, you were going to smile at me in the hallway the next day or watch me from afar with that look in your eyes as if you'd forgiven everything, no matter what I did to you. You would have this smile and pretend it was okay. Do you know how much it pissed me off? Koski's voice sounded strained. What the fuck is wrong with you? Izuku bit his cheek to calm his voice. He looked up at Kotsky with obvious te- tear streaks. Is that why you left me alone after a fight? Behind that one cafe, ground zero, when we were 15? Izuku remembered that he only had that one argument where Izuku raised his hand to Kotsky for the first time. The blonde had left him primarily alone afterwards, but he never understood why until now. It was the first time you actually did some shit for yourself, even if you apologized like a bitch for it afterwards, Kotsky tells him, voice full of venom. I fucking hate people who are fine living in their own shit. You shove all your anger and bullshit away, but I can see in your damn eyes how much it hurts you. You're so fucking easy to read, Deku. Izuku's shoulders continued to shake from the shock and pain of hearing all this relayed to him as Kotsky keeps telling him, and it's not just me, Kotsky laughs. 
You let everyone step over you, and you do nothing about it. The green ant shakes his head. No, I don't. Just to have some pride for himself, even though he knew Kotsky was right. Oh, you don't? Kotsky sounded extremely irked. I don't. Azuku makes his final attempt to save himself. You do, Kotsky tells him, making his way over to the green ant, and his words slap Azuku in the face. You let your mom, you let the students, you let yourself step all over you, and you smile and pretend it's all fucking dandy. Kelsey looked at him incredulously. Who the hell even taught you that? You think the only emotions worth feeling are happy-go-lucky giddiness and constant joy? Kelsey scoffs. You think it's healthy to shove your anger, your sadness, all of your emotions that you think are negative? Well, let me teach you something, Deku. You're going to feel it either way, whether or not you want to. It's a matter of now or later. You're going to feel angry, sad, frustrated, no matter how much you shove it away. You're just saving it for later. You're just building up that shit until it consumes you. And once you let it go, and trust me when I say you will let it go, you're not going to even know what the fuck to do with yourself. Azuku's eyes widen. All of these statements Azuku knew applied to Koski as well, but up until now, he didn't know they could be applied to himself. I can't. Azuku cries silently. I can't help it. I want to see you get angry, Deku. Koski tongues his cheek and reaches out to tilt up Azuku's chin. I want you to get mad. I want to see you grow a pair of fucking balls and stop taking shit from me, from your mother, from anyone. Sure, I have fucking expectations on me, but you think you don't give yourself your own? People expect you to be the town sweetheart, to be perfect, to always fucking smile. And like me, you can't break out of it either. Azuku shakes his head as if he didn't want to hear the truth. Kachan is hard. It's harder than you think. Kotsky ignored him. Have you ever told your mom about how fucking impressive she is? Have you ever told anyone about how frustrated you are with your dad for leaving you? Because I know you are. Have you ever told me how much you hate me for all that I did? Have you ever told anyone how sick you are of people thinking you're a goody two-shoes? Ha! Huh. And you think I'm emotionally closed off? I don't hate you. Azuku shakes his head, eyes closed, so that Kotsky couldn't see the redness as he cries. I never hated you. Kotsky ignores him. Aren't you sick of being the perfect son with the perfect plans and the perfect attitude? Aren't you sick of it? I want to see you angry. It's fucking good for you. It's natural. You're letting everyone tell you how to feel, how to act, what to do, except your damn self, Deku. Even now, when you're lecturing me, you apologize way too much and demand too little. Azuku opened his eyes and stared up at those red ones, now filled with emotion, frustration, anger, disgust, careful, but the ones that Azuku was most surprised to see, pleading. Kotsky's thumb moved up to Azuku's cheek to wipe the tears away. Don't cry, Kotsky tells him. Azuku laughs very softly through the tears. How can I not? You just kind of destroyed any image of comfort I could ever possibly have. Kotsky's tone at this this time was a lot less angry, and he continues to wipe away Izuku's tears. You're not allowed to feel negative things. You don't need to pretend you're happy. You're allowed to feel negative things. You don't need to pretend you're happy when you're not. Excited when you're drained. Content when you want change. You're allowed to get mad at me. To defy people's expectations of you. To go off on people. And you said it ain't fucking productive? Bullshit. When is advocating for yourself not productive, Deku? Azuku leans into the Kotsky's touch, and his teary eyes glance up at Kotsky, wondering how the blonde could give this advice but not take it himself. Kotsky, I think I understand, but... But I need to follow my own advice, too? But in the opposite direction? Kotsky rolls his eyes, but his tone was gentle. I get it. I get it, all right. Azuku shook his head and held on to Kotsky's cheek, hand on his cheek with his own. No, you have to promise me, Kachan. Promise you what? Kuski asks. Promise me you'll try, Izuku begs quietly. Try to embrace your positive emotions, and I'll try to confront mine. Kuski looks down at the shorter male in front of him, and doesn't move his hand from the intimate position, which could almost be even considered the first step. Izuku stares at him with wanting eyes, and Kuski takes him t his time to answer. When he does... Kotsky bumps their foreheads together and closes his eyes with a sigh. We got shit to work on, don't we? The admittance of this was just as important, but Izuku insisted with a whisper. Promise me. Without moving their position, Kotsky hesitantly tells Izuku, 
I don't make promises I don't know if I can keep. Then make sure you keep it, Kachan. Azuki searches him. You told me to make more demands, right? Promise me then. Promise me you'll try and keep it, Deku. No, Azuki shakes his head. Not after you said all that. Not after everything you just told me. Promise me, Kachan. Kotsky looks at him with conflicted eyes, and Izuku knew it was not an easy road to change, not an easy realization to know you need change. Many years had made Kotsky into who he was, and it was going to be a long process to unwind all of that. But ultimately, Kotsky tells him, looking away, I promise. Izuku looks satisfied with this for now, but there was still something that needed, that seemed to be on the tip of his tongue, and Kotsky noticed. What is it now? The blonde asked, thumbing the smallest cheek. Azuku's voice seemed insecure as he spoke. Do you actually hate me? Azuku immediately felt like throwing up in anticipation for the answer, but he heard Koski sigh, and he moved his hand from Azuku's cheek to run up through the greenette's hair before deciding to, for the first time in their entire relationship, be honest about how his thoughts towards Azuku. No. Azuku felt as if he knew that internally, but he needed confirmation. Kotsky was always straightforward with everything, except how he felt about him. He could be honest with quite about everything else, except his perspe perce perception of Azuku. And at times like this, Azuku needed Kotsky to tell him straight up, rather than having him guess and read between the lines. Azuku looks up at the other, eyes shining with both relief and overwhelming feelings. The blonde stood across from him, hair still slightly damp, looking down at the shorter boy. Mizuku wanted to simmer in this powerful but odd moment a little longer, where he could replay all of the words Kotsky and he had just exchanged in this, and simmer in it for a while. However, before he had the opportunity to do so, Azuku saw the flash of blue light, and his eyes darted towards that direction to find that a car was entering into the parking lot. At the disruption, Kotsky stepped away, putting his hands in his pocket, and turned towards the source of in the interruption. It wasn't just any car that entered the parking lot, but what looked like to be a police car. Since Ise was such a small town, both Izuku and Kotsky knew the entire small fleet of the police force, since they likely grew up riding their bikes next to the cops, or maybe their parents knew them. The siren sounded once, and Izuku and Kotsky walked towards the cop car with which was pulling up near Kotsky's car. Curious and wondering if there were any sort of trouble, both the boys began walking towards the cop car. When they were within earshot, earshot, the cop rolled down the window to reveal that it was Mr. Hadashi, who knew his mother relatively well. Mr. Hadashi? Izuku asked, probably looking like a mess. His eyes were most definitely red, and there were likely streaks of tears dried up on his face, and his clothes were almost dry but clearly looked like he'd been playing in the rain. Mr. Hadashi waved and looked surprised. Midoriya, I've been looking for you. I was going around the city looking for you, and saw a random car in the school parking lot. Turns out, it's you two. Bakugo, good evening to you too. Izuku came up to the window and leaned down a bit, furrowing his brows. You've been looking for me? Is something wrong? Uh, Mr. Hadashi kind of scratched the back of his head. It depends. On? Azuku frowned, confused. He turned to look over at Kotsky, who just leaned against the car and shrugged at Azuku. On whether or not you're okay, Mr. Hadashi says. So, are you alright? Azuku shook his head furiously. Yeah, I'm perfectly fine. Wait, why does it depend on if I'm okay? What's going on? And why were you looking for me? Oh, um... The cop looked a little apologetic as he begins to tell Izuku. Well, we got a 911 call about an hour ago from Inko, er, your mom. Izuku's heart dropped, and his fists clenched up automatically. You have to be kidding me, he thought to himself. And, Mr. Hadashi continued, she was freaking out, crying and begging and everything, saying that you went missing and that you were gone. So I asked her when was the last time she had contact with you. The cop waved his hand around lazily. Protocol, you know, and she says that you text her earlier saying you'll be home around 10 So I told her that's fine and to wait until 10 and you weren't missing You probably went out with your friends and didn't specify where you were. My daughter does that here and there. It's not that big of a deal Izuku felt lightheaded and he couldn't believe that his mother actually But she insisted that you were missing 
and that I needed to come find you. She threatened to call other cops, so I decided to just go find you so she'll calm down a little bit. Although I must say I was sure you were fine. I would advise, though, knowing how Inko is, to just text her when you'll be home. She called the cops? Azuku tells him, as if wanting confirmation. His voice was unsteady and was stiff. Yeah, Mr. Hidashi looked a little sorry. She called the cops. Even though I told her I was going to be home around 10, Azuka's voice was taut as he checked his phone. It's 9. It's literally 9.23. Midoriya, I'm just doing my job. Mr. Hadashi held out both of his hands, and your mom insisted I find you. Azuku flipped his head over to Koski, who looked cautious of Azuku. He knew he must have looked tense right now. A vein was threatening to burst out of his forehead, and he felt both embarrassed, ashamed, angry, and sad all at the same time. Any momentary happiness he could have had today was completely turned upside down. And where is she now? Is she at home or at the station? Azuku asked, voice very rigid and for a moment terrifying. Mr. Hidashi tells him, She should be at home. I told her there's no need to go to the station. Good, Azuku says. Great. Wait, Deku, Kasuki began. However, before Kasuke could finish any thought, Azuku had already taken off towards home. He didn't bother saying bye or grabbing his backpack from the awning. The greenette just ran towards the direction of his home at maximum speed, weaving in through the neighborhoods to get on the fastest route. The entire time, anger and sadness surged through his head. His mother was paranoid, sure. He accepted that fact a long time ago, from when he was three years old and above. She's really only let him hang out with a select group of people, and she's always restricted what he did. He had to stay within walking distance to his house. He had to text her back within within an hour. He had to be home before 8 p.m. He had to always accept her rules or not go out at all. And when he was old enough, he got to be home later, but nothing changed after 10 p.m. He could be outside of walking distance, but but she would give him a long talk beforehand. Every time he's asked to hang out, it feels like he's fighting on a battlefield. The tension was so thick that he could cut it with a knife. So yes, he knew she was overprotective. But this? Calling the cops before he had told her when he'd be home. This was something else. This was way worse than calling up his school to prevent him from attending from a very event he'd he'd planned. This was worse than taking away years of his childhood and teenage experience. He was embarrassed. He saw that look of pity from the cop's eyes, his friend's eyes, from Kotsky's mouth. They all knew his situation, and they felt sorry for him. And now the woman had gone so far as to call the cops on a full-grown adult who should be able to decide to go home at 10 p.m., which was generous. Azuku ran until his lungs felt as if they were going to collapse on him, but the anger that coursed through his soul pushed him forwards. His footsteps left large splashes over the rainwater everywhere. He couldn't tell whether he wanted to cry or whether he wanted to scream. He hit the ground with every hard step, and he needed to get home now. He didn't know what he'll say when he sees her. He doesn't know what he'll do. He was utterly losing his mind. He turned onto his street and saw his house in the distance. The porch lights were on and the door was wide open, but he couldn't see his mom. If it was as if she was patrolling in and out of her house, waiting for him to arrive home. Azuku felt anger just thinking about it, and he ran even faster. His legs wanted to give out, but he ran up on his driveway and onto the porch. When he got there, Azuku put his hands on his knees and heaved, catching his breath. His chest went up and down, regaining oxygen, and he tilted his head up. Finally, Azuku walked into the house and found his mom sitting on the kitchen stool, hands on a mug of something that looked frantic and worried, muttering to herself with puffy red eyes and tears all over her face. When she finally noticed him at the door, the woman's eyes widened and she looked like her entire life force had been returned to her, cried some more, and called out, Azuku? Inko called out, getting off the stool. You're home? You called the cops? Azuku just stated it, voice even. His eyes were bloodshot. His fists were clenched by his sides. Inko ignored him, even though she, he knew she heard him. Oh my god, why do you look like that? You look a mess. Have you been hurt? Have you been hurt? Haven't you? That's why you shouldn't have listened. You called, Azuku began again, tone much more serious now as he enunciated each word. The cops. The air felt as if it was sucked out of the house, and even the wind outside began to whistle a little louder. Soon enough, it'll begin raining, and all they had to do was wait. 
Azuki's eyes were unusually dark, and he could feel himself losing grip of all composure he's built up over the years and years of suppressing his feelings. It was like a dam of hidden anger and frustration leaking from a crack that was bound to burst. Inko finally got the message that Izuku felt a certain way about this, and suddenly got defensive. Of course I did. I didn't know where you were, and you just wouldn't text me or call me back. What was I supposed to do, Zuku? You're my baby, and I must make sure you're okay. You could have trusted me. Azuku gripped his phone tightly in frustration. I texted you. I'll be home at 10. It was barely 9 when you called 911. You didn't tell me where you were, Azuku. Inko's voice was steady and sweet as it always was, and Azuku was getting sick of it by the second. I'm 18. I can vote. I can drive. I am a legal adult. And yet I can't make my own decisions about where I go. Izuku asked, tone incredulous, as he stares at her with big eyes. His string was about to snap. You are still loving, living under this house and my rules, Izuku. Inko reminds him. What I say goes. If you keep doing things like this, then I won't be for longer. Izuku tells her, voice tight and body filled with the weight of his anger. His mother's eyes widened significantly, and Izuku shook his head, wanting to collapse from how heavy it feels to live in this house. Even if you do stop, I can't live in this house any longer, Mom. I can't do this anymore. Izuku's voice then cracked. Izuku, don't say that. Inkyo held onto her mug tightly. You're tired, and you don't understand what you're saying. Izuku t- takes a step closer, feeling his blood pressure rise with every sentence. I understand exactly what I'm saying, Mom. He begins to speak more firm and loud. I can do I can't do this anymore, he repeats. Inko just tells him again, You don't mean it. You need to go up. Take a shower. I'll let your behavior go tonight. But we are going to be talking about this in the morn No, Izuki tells her. Let's talk about this tonight. You were up for it a couple of minutes ago, weren't you, Mom? He steps forward some more with a hint of a smile on his face, one that revealed that he had just given up. He continues, Why aren't you up for it now? Because I'm not just going to be bowing down and apologizing for getting home before I told you I was going to? He had a crazed smile on his face, as if he was going insane. Inko was quiet, but her mouth was gaped. She stared at Izuku as if she was looking at a different person, as if she was seeing a monster. If she wanted to see a smile so bad on her precious boy's face all the time, then here it was, one that was devoid of happiness. Izuku continued, walking one step towards her, voice crescendoing as he spoke. Were you expecting me to come home and thank you for caring so much, so much that you called the cops and wasted their time? They have better things to do with their time, Mom. Do you understand that? Izuku talked to her as if she was dumb. They have better things to do than to look for normal adults doing normal activities at normal times. I was fine, Mom. I was fine. I don't need you breathing down my neck every single minute. Inko looked cautious but kept her volume level even. Azuku, you know it was because I was wor- because you were worried for me. Azuku waved his arms around dramatically as if he were drunk and turned around in place. Because I'm your precious baby boy. Because you care about me. Because you know what's best for me. Azuku laughed. <laughs> Mom, do you know how many times we've had this exact conversation? Do you know how many times I've heard those words come out of your mouth? Azuku, are you okay? Inko looked at him as if he was going insane. You're not being yourself. You're scaring me, Azuku. Azuku only added to her perception by laughing at her reaction. <sighs> I'm scaring myself, Mom. Everything's been changing so fast that I feel like I can barely catch up. The world is moving around me so quickly, and I'm only beginning to stumble behind to grab my place. And yet, I feel more alive and aware than I've ever been. Isn't that crazy? He wipes his eyes and laughs some more. He came from one hard conversation back into the damp, humid parking lot to another one immediately the moment he stepped into his own home. Inko shook her head, curling into herself. Azuku, you need to go to bed now. No, Azuku tells her, feeling a surge of power at the fact that he just straight up defied his mother. He was going too far, he knew it. He looked deranged, he knew that too. And yet... This was what happened when the 18 years of pent-up anger comes out, and he didn't know what to do with himself. I'll drag you to bed, Izuku, Inka warned him calmly. Do not test me. Izuku shrugs and gives her a funny grin. I'll just sneak out. What? 
Inko blinked up at her son, shocked to hear such a response. I said, Izuku repeated, giving up. I'll just sneak out of the house. Inko was taken aback, and Izuku wonders if this was good enough to make the calm and collected woman lose her composure. Inko shook her head. You would never. You're a good boy, Izuku. Izuku smiles at her. Mom, does it surprise you to know that I'm not that good of a boy? Does it surprise you to know that I sneak out at least once a week and do other things I only dream about to watch others do? Speaking of, Izuku pretends to be curious by thumbing his chin. Why do I even feel like I have to sneak out? Shouldn't I, at this age, be allowed to just leave? To go to an ice cream parlor? Or to a skating rink? And then he shrugs as if he didn't care. That's just what the whole world thinks, but not you, apparently. Inko shook her head and stared at him in horror. No, no, this isn't happening. Mom, does it shock you to know I do a lot of dumb stuff when I go out? I swim really far out into the ocean. I sneak into lakes at night. I go explore abandoned buildings here and there, too. I also get hurt sometimes. Izuku shoves it in her face. Little cuts here and there from rocks or branches. I bruise once in a while, too. But I'm such a baby, I can't take care of myself, right? And that's why I need to be kept inside of this house all of the time, right? Izuku sarcastically laughs, and could put her foot down on the carpet. Enough, Izuku, you're far out of line. I don't know what's gotten into you or why you're like this tonight, but you will deal with the consequences. Her voice wavered. I'm putting a tracker on your phone, and you're not leaving this house. Not even for the project. I'll contact Mr. Toshi. The boy in question just smiled lazily, but there was no humor in his face. I'm far out of line. You called the cops, he repeated for the third time. You've said that, Inko said, voice more terse now, but still candy-like. And Izuku wonders what it will take for her to get truly angry. And you haven't given me an explanation that isn't stupid. Izuku giggles, feeling so out of it he wanted to die. He knew he looked insane, and yet he couldn't make himself think hard and tiptoe around this conversation with her like he used to. Inko looked as if she was about to cry at his words. You think me caring about you is stupid, she sounded so hurt. You think me wanting you to be safe is stupid, Izuku. And there you go again. Izuku raised his hands and gestured towards her, turning a fake invisible audience turning to a fake invisible audience. There she is, everyone. Exhibit A. I call this the manipulative mother. She's sweet. She'll take care of you, but boy, when she doesn't get the answer she wants or expects, she'll make you feel like the bad guy by acting like a victim. And man, does it make you feel bad. Izuku's voice was cracking left and right as he speaks, and he begins to cry while talking. She'll say everything all nice and soft, so if you don't show any negative emotions, you look like the evil one. She'll twist your words around so that it looks like you don't like her. Isn't she amazing? Izuku bowed to the fake audience in their broken living room. Why are you doing this to me, Izuku? Inko spoke with a very gentle expression, voice pleading. And you're doing it again, Izuku points out, crying with her. You're always doing this, Mom. If I say anything unsatisfactory, you get all quiet. And you'll say things like, make me feel bad and a neglectful son. And if I end up thinking it was my fault, how is that fair? Azuki looks down at his feet. How is that fair? He repeats while burying his face in his hands. I'm just doing my job as a mother, Inko tells him making her case, because as a mother, I do what I have to do to keep my son safe, even if you don't like it. When you have kids, you'll under- When I have kids, Izuku says, now completely serious, although quiet tears slide down his cheeks. I will not repeat your mistakes. I'm not going to suffocate them. I'm not going to make them feel like they can't talk to you about certain things in fear that you're going to freak out. Izuku slowly got louder, stepping closer to his mother for emphasis. I'm not going to manipulate them into feeling bad about being with me 24-7. I'm not going to make my kids... Izuku, you've been raising your voice. You need to calm down. Remember what I taught you. Getting angry never solved. Inko began her words, very careful. No, I'm sick of that. Izuku shouted then, bursting out into big, visible tears, eyes more red while staring at his mother. Inko, startled by the shout, dropped her mug on the ground with a clang. Since it was plastic, it didn't break. However, the coffee that she had spilled all over the floor and soaked into her slippers. 
It spread into the carpet of their living room, and Izuku knew the brown stain will forever remind him of this night. Izuku looked down at it, then back up at his mother, whose face was shocked and incredulous. I, I'm, Izuku felt his chest heave up and down, but he was nervous. He's never said anything like this to his mother before, and he was habituated to never do so. I'm s sick of it, Mom. I'm sick of shoving away. He cries some more as he thinks back to what Koski had said to him, and he continues, my negative emotions. I'm sick of having to be perfect, of being happy all the time, even when I'm not, of having to be grateful for everything, even if it hurts me of having to deny what my body naturally feels, just so I don't make others feel bad. Izuku clutched the bottom of his shirt, just to have something to hold on to. I taught you that way, so that you could grow up into a respectable young man, Izuku. Inko justifies herself. Negativity only weighs you down. It just hurts you. It clouds your judgment, and you end up doing horrible things and saying things you don't mean. I don't want that for my son. I want you to grow up happy and bright. With only love to give, what is so wrong with that? What is wrong is when I feel like I can't give anything else but love. I'm so one-dimensional to other people with no emotions besides positive ones, and I get stepped on by every... Azuka tells her, throwing his hands up. I don't want to give you anything else but love. It's all you need in life. Inko tried to convince him. Don't be naive, Mom, Izuku laughs dryly. If love was all we needed, why did Dad leave? Inko's expression towards Izuku then was as if she had if as if he had shot her. And then he saw it, anger fueling up inside her, entering her body like rain in a de de desert valley. He's done it. Inko opened her mouth and then closed it again, as if holding herself back. She grabbed her things off the counter and she stumps towards her room. Izuku wasn't going to let that happen. The greenette ran towards her room and ahead of her while muttering, No, 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 no. Izuku, her tone was not playing around. Please move. No. Izuku stood in front of the door, blocking her entrance. I deserve this conversation, Mom. You owe it to me. Inko looked up at him and then, with equally red eyes, I'm not talking about that man. He gave you me. Izuku pointed at himself, if nothing else. Why can't we just appreciate that? Inko then looked as if she was near her breaking point. He was selfish and never grew up. Always wanted to go to too many places, do too many things. He had dreams that were bigger than his responsibilities. He never wanted to settle down and be with family. He did, Izuku argued. You just never wanted to do anything with him. He wasn't perfect. He didn't have priorities, but you never tried either. You never wanted to go anywhere, do anything. I don't need to, Inko finally raised her voice. I had you and him, and that was enough. Mom, you have no ambition outside of me, Izuku cries while shaking his head. You open up a shop because you need to make money, not because you like making custom prints. You never wanted to see the world to experience more than just what this town had, and, and that's fine. If you're happy, that's fine, but that doesn't mean I have to live like that too. That doesn't mean I have to live every day wondering what is more out there or what could have been. And so what now? Inko sounded bitter. You're just going to leave this town, move away to some city, and go to some pretentious school. And what happens when nobody knows you there? When you miss your mama? What happens when you realize that no matter what, nothing is like here at home? Then I'll go home to visit. Mom, you're missing the point, Azuka shakes his head. The point is that I want the option to come back and the option to leave without feeling as if I'm tearing us apart. Why does it have to be a choice? Why do I have to choose between my happiness and yours? Our happiness can be the same, Azuku, Inko stated. Sure, as long as it's your definition of happiness, right? Azuku laughed. Our happiness, Inko repeated, really, Azuku called out to her, because you know what I want to do with my life? You've always known. From when I was a kid to now, you've seen me look up to athletes, to catch on. You've seen me dream, doodle, and analyze how they move. You know I want to go into... You know what I want to go into. You know where I had the best opportunity to do what I love, and yet you still think my best chance is here. I... I love you, say, but I'm not going to die here without seeing everywhere else, without doing more. Inko was quiet. 
So look me in the eye, Mom, Azuku pleaded, and tell me again that you know what my happiness means. Inko's tears were pulling in her waterline, her mouth in a permanent wobble, as she turns her head away and wipes at her face, and her words were in agony when she speaks again, ignoring his question altogether. Why did you have to grow up, Azuku? Inko moved away from him. Why do you have to go and change? We were perfect as we were. You and me, Mommy and... You're afraid of change, Mom, Azuku tells her, and he tilts his head up to the ceiling light, as if the tears will fall back inside of his tear ducts. He hiccups, here like this town, Azuku accuses, stuck in the past, and I don't plan on getting left behind with you. Inko laughs at his futile attempt. Azuku, where are you going to go? You have nowhere to go but here. Azuku hates the way she was laughing at him, so she tell he tells it to her straight. I got accepted to Waseda University in Tokyo. I'll take out loans and spend 10 years paying them off if I need to. His mother's laugh stops at that, and her entire body goes frozen and her eyes search Izuku in a desperate attempt to see if it was a lie. But Izuku stares at her straight on so that she knows he was serious. He was completely serious, and she needed to understand now or never that if she didn't change, he wasn't going to be anchored down to this house with her any longer. Inko was completely silent, not saying a word, just looking at him in horror, as if she had as if he had betrayed her in the worst way possible. Mom, do you know how much the way I was raised messed me up? His vo voice was quiet now. Inko's lips quivered as he could see her hand shake, but she said nothing. Whenever I talk to you or anyone else, I have to always think of what to say to make everyone else happy, even if I'm not. If I ever get angry or sad or even jealous, I feel as if I have to shove it away. When we get close to arguing, I have to take a deep breath and suppress my anger or my frustration. And I repeat in my head, don't get angry. Anger doesn't solve anything. In my head like a mantra, because you always taught me to never be unhappy or ungrateful. As you bit his lip then, because just because I suppress it doesn't mean it goes away. It's there, just building up, and I don't know how to handle my, handle my anger anymore. Even now, I, I can't even control myself because I don't know what to do, Azuku says between small cries. I'm angry, and I'm sad, I'm frustrated, and I feel like the world is passing by me faster than I can hold on. I don't know what to do. He hiccups between tiny cries. Mom, I don't know how to handle it because I was never taught to be okay with these feelings. Azuku wiped out his face. Inko still had said nothing at this point. Zuku looked at his mother then, smiling gently. You wanted to see me smile all the time, right? Here's my smile. He forces it. Does it make you happy? Does it make you feel satisfied, Mom? Inko looked down at her hands. No, don't turn away. Look at your son. Azuku tells her, you wanted me to smile so badly, right? Then look at me. Azuku cries why he smiles. Should I be like this forever? Will that make you happy? When Midoriya Inko refuses to answer, Azuku drops the fake smile and sighs. He knew his mother was a good person. He knew she had good qualities, ones that he was proud to have inherited, including her hardworkingness, but that didn't excuse her bad ones. I love you, Mom, Azuku whispered. I just want to love me, too. And then Azuku walks away, stepping up the stairs as he feels all the tears he held back choke up in his throat, and outside Azuku hears the rain start pouring again, and he didn't want to be here anymore, he didn't want to be in his house, breathe in this air, and feel all of this tension and strain interwoven around every floorboard, every fiber of carpet, every square inch of his home. He couldn't stay here tonight, not when his mother and the conversation he just had snuck into every crevice of his brain. He felt so guilty, he felt so bad for all that he said and all that he's done to Inko tonight, but he constantly reminded himself. He was allowed to feel anger, he was allowed to step up for himself, he was allowed to sit in pain and sadness and shouldn't shove it away, just for it to get worse. That didn't mean sitting in his house with his mother right downstairs wasn't difficult, and so he didn't. He couldn't. Izuku couldn't stay here right now. Going into his room, the green paces around the floor and cries into his hands. He was panicking and going delirious. He had so much emotion pent up inside of him, wanting to pour out all at once. But the floodgates were only so wide. He pulled out his phone and dialed a couple numbers. Nobody picked up, and Izuku felt more alone than ever. He felt completely and utterly alone in a world 
And on a day that he wanted to spit in his face, he needed someone, anyone, and he couldn't be in this damn house for another second. Dropping everything but his phone, Izuku stepped back down the stairs. The lights of the living room were still on, and Izuku saw that Inka was sitting in one of the armchairs. Her head didn't even turn to him when he walked past the living room, and Izuku cried some more, suppressing his sounds until he opened the door and walked out of the house in the rain. If she didn't know he left the house randomly before, then she did now, and she didn't even look at him. Izuku sobbed into the night air the moment he stepped out onto the porch, pulling his body forward even though it wanted to collapse out of mental exhaustion, and he walked through the streets of Issei as the rain soaked him for the second time this day. His shirt was once more matted to his body, but everything felt like a numbing sensation, and he just wanted to feel anything. He could barely see through the downpour and his only guiding lights were the street lamps that were slightly blurred out by the rain. Azuku walked for a while, wondering where his tear ducts when his tear ducts will dry up, but they felt endless. He never spoke to his mother like that. He never let his mental restraints go like that. He never behaved like that. He doesn't know what to do. Izuku finds himself more intentional than not, standing in front of a door that belonged to someone very familiar shivering to himself because the rain was colder now than it was earlier. His lips were probably blue, his eyes were definitely red, but he couldn't even bother to think about that. Izuku wonders if he should knock, but he was done wondering when his body automatically reached up and rung the doorbell as if he needed it. He wonders if Aunt Mitsuki or Uncle Masura will come to greet him. If they did, Izuku wasn't exactly sure if he can explain himself in this mental state. He was an absolute mess. He stands out there on the front door for a bit, shaking in a spot and crying to himself. He wanted to stop, but he couldn't. Every time he tried to calm down and force his tears to stop, one thought of what happened tonight, and it, wa and it was waterworks all over again. Izuku was about to give up altogether and accept that he'll just roam the streets of Issei until morning, or at least until he can find the courage to go back to his house, when the door of, Bakugo, of the Bakugo family opened to reveal an irritated-looking Bakugo Koski with rings around his eyes, holding the door aggressively as if ready to start a fight. But once the blonde saw who was on his porch, the athlete's red eyes widened at the clearly distraught state of Izuku, standing there in the soaking rain, looking as if he was ready to give up on trying. Deku? Koski asked, unsure if he was actually seeing Izuku at his doorstep this late at night. Azuku wiped at his eyes uselessly and tried to even his voice, but it came out in hiccups. Hi, Kachun. He hiccuped. I'm sorry for showing up at this time. His voice gets tinier at the end, and his composure comes to a breaking point, and he cried near the end. I just don't have anywhere to go right now. I just can't go home. He shook his head, and his chest shook. I don't want to bother you, but I just don't know where to go. And I just, I just had an argument with my mom, and it just really hurt really bad. I just can't be home right now, so please, can I just come here, Koski tells him, stepping back so that Izuku could come in. And Izuku, taking what Koski said the wrong way, steps in and immediately throws himself on the blonde, wrapping, wrapping his arms around the athlete's shoulder and immediately sobbing. He just needed anyone right now to hold him, to let him scream and cry. Izuku was desperate and at the first opportunity jumped on the blonde. Kotsky, taken aback, just stood there for a second, not holding the other back in a way Izuku needed him to. Instead, he just stands there for a minute as Izuku slumps his body against his and his shoulders were shaking. Kotsky's clothes were immediately soaked with rainwater and tears. So, I guess the talk didn't go well? Kotsky asks, tone low and steady. Izuku shakes his head, not bothering to have a verbal reply, and clings onto the taller boy while he continues to cry. Koski just sighs before bending down slightly to pick Izuku up and lay the smaller boy across his arms, as if he's carrying him in a bridal style. Izuku was still wrapped up around his shoulders, but Koski held him up while telling the other, Come on, let's get you dried off and in bed, Koski tells the other, and Izuku didn't care where he ends up, he just was glad to not be in his own house. Koski takes care of him well, in the usual silent way that he did. The blonde takes him into the guest bedroom that Izuku stayed in the first night he was ever here, and he sits Izuku down on the edge of the silk bed, careful not to get the comforter soaked in water. The boy didn't want to let go, but Koski softly pried his arms away until he, could, until he could go and get a towel and some new clothes. 
When Koski came back, Izuku was si still silently crying, but he was reducted to hiccups instead of full-on sobs. That was good, because it meant Izuku was coming up from his breakdown. Now his head just felt hazy, and all he wanted to do was be with someone, and be held and cared for. Koski dried his hair off with the towel, careful not to be aggressive, and then he peeled off his shirt before wiping him down with the towel too. When Izuku was dry, before Koski could put on another shirt, Izuku in a whisper tells the other to leave it. He'll sleep without it tonight. Koski hesitates but complies anyway before moving down on the leg. The blonde removes the matted wet shorts and dries off his thighs and legs with the towel, careful with every moment movement, and steps back, turning around after tossing Izuku a pair of boxers to use as sleeping pants. In the meanwhile, Kotsky goes over to change to a new, a new pair of pants and ditches the shirt as well, considering that he got rain on it earlier from Izuku's hug. The sequence of actions felt as if it took forever, from the moment Izuku arrived at the house to when he got fully changed. When Koski changes into his new pants, the blonde walks back into the guest bedroom with a glass of water in his hand. Drink this. Izuku reaches out with both hands and takes it, slowly bringing the cup to his mouth, and quenched his throat until the glass was half empty and then sets it on the nightstand. It was quiet for a while, and Izuku just couldn't find himself to say much. Koski didn't look like he'd pressure him to either, which he was grateful for. He didn't want to rehash any of it. The blonde just stood there for a couple minutes, off to the side of the bed, while Izuku sits on the edge, staring out into blackness. The rain outside persisted, and it was awfully dark in the room, but their eyes were adjusted to the dark blue tint of the bedroom and the gleam of the silk sheets and comforter. Finally, Koski quietly tells the shorter boy, I'm going to head back to my room. Are you going to be all right? Izuku then turns over to the handsome blonde, filled with what he knew now to be the beginnings of love. Kachon... The boy in question answers, What is it? Can you stay with me tonight? Izuku asks, wondering if this was too much, but ultimately not even caring. I'll be across the room, Katsuki tells him. Izuku shakes his head. No, here, in this bed. Katsuki's eyes widen at the suggestion, and he looks at the bed before his eyes go back to Izuku. Duck. Please, Izuku whimpered. I just want someone near... Koski looked conflicted for a moment, as if he was battling with his own mind, but Izuku's voice was so laced with desperation and plead that it was impossible to say no, and so Koski wordlessly makes his way over to the other side of the bed. Izuku shifts to the left side and crawls up to where the comforter was tucked in and untucks it. He slowly slides himself in until he was settled down on the soft pillows. From besides him, Kotsky untucked the comforter as well and slipped himself in on the opposite side, laying straight up with his arms crossed above the blanket. Izuku just stares at him from the side, and he wishes that he could touch the other right now. Right now, he wanted and needed nothing more than that, to touch and be touched. Izuku wanted him so badly, and this moment of strife in his life, he felt as if he needed it. Izuku's body gravitated toward Kotsky like the moon to the sun. The blonde's eyes were still open, as if he was thinking, and Izuku didn't want him to go to sleep. Not when he was this close. Not when he could do so much more. Izuku was barely thinking straight when, Kots when he asked Kotsky, Can you hold me? Izuku asked him, voice soft, with want clearly laced in it, so much that the definition of hold could be argued. Kalski's attention immediately shifted, and he turned his head over to where Azuku was leaning on the side towards the blonde, eyes looking away but body very, very clearly positioned towards the taller boy. Uh, Kalski didn't seem to be expecting this request, for Azuku could hear the uncomfortable shifting in the bed. You're asking for too much, Deku. Kalski warns him gently. Azuku's heart felt like breaking all over again, but he needed so much. He needed it so much he couldn't give up. Then feel generous tonight, Izuku whispers to him. Once again, Kotsky looked confused and at a loss. I'm not, Kotsky began, voice seeming more genuine. I'm not meant for those kind of touches, Deku. And Izuku knew exactly what the blonde meant by that. Kotsky was used to rough, to heavy, to aggressive touches that were purely sexual. He wasn't used to soft holds that were meant for close friends and lovers. The blonde continued. I don't know how. Izuku searches Koski's eyes, which were turned towards him, 
and the greenette could have guessed that about Kotsky, and he feels like if it were a normal day, and he was in the right mindset, he would understand, and he would care, and he would definitely not do what he was wanting to do next. However, it wasn't a normal day, and his mentality was out of whack at the moment, and so, in a moment of need and desire, Azuki slowly brought himself up to his elbows and sliding over just a bit to Kotsky and reached out. The athlete watched the other the entire time, from the look on Izuki's face to the way his neck was exposed to reveal delicious smooth skin. Koski watches as Izuku reaches his hand out to grab onto Koski's own hand as if to guide him. Izuku picks up Koski's right hand that was just resting there and brings it up closer until it was headed towards Izuku's body. Then touch me in the way you know how, Izuku whispered out suggestively, eyes slightly hooded as he brings Katsuki's hand down to touch his body, resting the athlete's large and rough palm against his chest, over the perfect budding nipples from the coldness of the room, and down his torso. Katsuki let the greenette play for, play from a moment, before pulling his hand back and turning his head away. Daku, stop. Izuku didn't understand. What about Izuku was just so unappealing for Katsuki to not want him in the way he wanted others? The boy scooted closer until his body was quite near Koski's side, and Izuku reached over to gently touch Koski's jaw, bringing his face over to look Izuku in the eye. In the dim, bluish tint of the bedroom, Izuku can see the red gleam, and he wanted so badly for Koski to touch him in any way. He didn't care. Why? Izuku whispered, bringing his forward down to rest against Koski's. You don't want to? The greenette then moved his legs so that they were, that they would go over Kotsky's hips, and pushes his body forward until he was now on top of Kotsky, straddling the blonde's hips while his upper body still laid on top of Kotsky's. Azuku was merely inches above the taller boy, and his palm was resting against Kotsky's sharp jaw. Their lips were barely three inches apart, and they were touching chest to chest. Kotsky breathed into his mouth all without making contact. Deku, you don't want this. Shit. He cursed as Azuku grinded his hips down. Azuku hovered his lips above Kotsky's, and they both played a game of where they got so, so close but never actually touch, before asking the other, How are you going to tell me what I want, Kachan? Kotsky sounded adamant when he tells Azuku this next. The blonde's hands were now on his hips, not actually trying to push Izuku off, but not bringing him any closer. You're fucking angry, sad, frustrated, and you're probably feeling lonely as shit right now, Deku. He growled in Izuku's ear. You don't want this. I could be anyone, and you'd think this is what you want. Izuku shakes his head no and wanted so badly to get into a kiss, but his lips just played a game with Kotsky grinding up against the other with his face right there, barely inches apart. So? So? Kotsky says angrily in a low voice. Fucking stop it. You'll regret it in the morning if you go any farther, Deku. Azuku laughed prettily and sits up until he was truly straddling Kotsky's hips and Izuku tilted his head back while using his own hands to play with his pert nipples, pert nipples, making Koski watch him toy with his cute little buds. You're not stopping me. But Koski couldn't reply. Izuku saw it too. Under hooded eyes, Koski watches him play with his nipples, twisting and pulling at him at them while parting his lips as if he wanted something in it. Something salty, or maybe even a bit bitter. The blonde's eyes were watching him intently, words lost on the athlete, who lays there underneath him. Izuku, up to the game, begins to grind up on Kotsky's lap once again, making sure to bite his lip and smile lazily down at Kotsky. He then closes his eyes and tilts his head back until he lets out a quiet moan, enjoying Kotsky's fr friction providing, provided him. After a moment, the blonde in question snapped out of it and pulled himself up into a sitting position, with Izuku still on his lap, and gripped the boy's chin. Izuku felt so small compared to Kotsky, but enjoyed the feeling of being on him like this. He blinked up at Kotsky with wide doe eyes. You need fucking sleep, Deku. Kotsky warns him, eyes darkening. You're fucking delirious. 
You're clouded by all your damn emotions. You just need anyone to fuck you right now so you can distract yourself. And you don't fucking deserve that. Izuku raised an eyebrow up at Katsuki, who looked so serious. And you care about what I deserve? What if I want that? Izuku was just talking out of his ass. Should I go ask someone else? That was the wrong thing to say, because suddenly the positions were flipped, and Izuku was on his back, while Katsuki was pinning him down from the top. The blonde strength was unreal, and Izuku knew he couldn't move if he, sh if he tried. He looked up at Katsuki with his eyes filled with lust, and Katsuki had a wild and almost angry look on his face. You leave this room to get fucked by someone else, and I'll kill them, Katsuki warns with a dark tone. Izuku has noticed by now that Katsuki threatens that a lot. Izuku tempts him. Then fuck me, Kachan. The blatant request shocked Katsuki, who stared down at that freckled face, which looked at him now with such need. Izuku's lips were slightly parted, chest breathing heavily, and nipples were still as hard as ever. Izuku knew he was doing something. He glanced down to see that a slight tint had formed in Kotsky's pants, and so if nothing else, Izuku now knew he had the ability to attract Bakugo Kotsky. No, the athlete declares, brows furrowing, clear your fucking head. You'll fucking hate the idea of being with me come morning. But you? But will you? Izuku ignores Kotsky altogether. Kachan, does it hurt? The green at gestures his head down to Kotsky's crotch. I can help. You said you were frustrated, didn't you? Fuck, Katsuki mutters to himself, while his face was still turned to the side, and then he looks back down at Izuku. Fuck, shut up, he breathes. I'm going back to my room. You need sleep. Izuku reached up to hold on to Katsuki's jaw and bring the blonde back down, and he comes a little too easily, and they dance around each other's bodies on the bed. But why? I was told I'd give really good head, Izuku tells Katsuki and this made the aggressiveness in Kotsky spike to a level, to a high level, because at that comment, Kotsky stops their little games and pushes Izuku's shoulders into the mattress with another hand on the greenette's face, thumb prodding at those lips. And who the fuck told you that? Kotsky's eyes were burning and his tone was dangerous. Izuku's eyes widened, but he felt himself harden up a bit at the mere thought that Kotsky could be jealous. The blonde leaned down, pushing his shoulders into the mattress more, and he shoved his finger down Izuki's mouth, barking at a low, Is that what you and Fuckface have been up to? You've been sucking his cock? Kotsky's voice was pure venom. Izuku doesn't say anything, but instead he enjoys this look on Kotsky more than he should. It made the other even angrier. Tell me, nerd. Kotsky sticks his thumb deeper in Izuku's throat, and the shorter male loved it. Does he make you get on your knees? I bet he fucking holds your hair back while he slaps his balls on your chin. Kasi looks so pissed. God, I want to kill him. Should I? Why? Izuku laughs when Kasi pulls out his thumb, followed by a trail of saliva. Who am I to you? At this question, it was like it jolted Kotsky awake, because the blonde took a step back and looked at Izuku as if the question burned him. Izuku, now a little confused, waits for some sort of response from the other, only to get nothing, as Kotsky lets go of his pinned shoulder, and then he just declares, I'm not doing shit to you, and that's final. You're not leaving this room, and that's final. I'm not your mom. I don't want to fucking make your decisions for you. You've had enough of that shit already. But this? I'm not letting you go, and fuck just because you want a distraction. Kotsky tells him, reaching out to tuck a streak of Izuku's hair behind his ear. He knew where Kotsky was coming from, and yet Izuku fell, still felt rejected in a way. Izuku's eyes felt like watering again. Why am I not enough? Don't fucking ask that. Kotsky looked distressed at the question, and leans down again. The athlete was back on top of Izuku, but this time in a much gentler fashion. This time, Kotsky puts a hand on his waist and places his lips near Izuku's chin, hovering feather-like touches from his lips down differently, different parts of Izuku's body. I told you, Deku. Izuku watches him, heart pounding fast. Kotsky was so gentle right now, as if he knew how fragile Izuku's mind was at the moment. The athlete just moved down his torso and his waist, looking up at Izuku as he goes down. Go to sleep. You won't want me in the morning. Izuku... 
at just how careful Koski was handling him felt a little bit of his desperation seep out as he gets overwhelmed with something else, the feelings of falling in love with Koski. Koski, without even knowing Izuku's feelings, wasn't going to take advantage of Izuku's deranged and desperate state. Even when it was clear that the blonde was at least physically attracted to him, Kotsuki naively thought that Izuku was suddenly feeling this way about him, anyone because of how horrible his night had been, when it was more like Izuku had already felt this way to a minor extent, but his night has made him feel as if he needed it. And so he tells the other softly, And if I do, Kotsuki looks away, you won't. Izuku just sighs, and then lets his body go loose assigned to Koski that he wouldn't try anymore, and then he lays back into the bed. Looking off to the side, Koski sits in the same spot for a couple minutes, and they let, let the silence simmer in between them, allowing Izuku to calm down further and for Koski to contemplate on something. The greenette, after a couple more minutes to relax and reflect, hated that Koski was, re was right. He was absolutely shameless in his desperation, and he wasn't going to enjoy the full experience if the entire time he was just praying it would distract him still. He felt rejected in a way. Then, from his left, Koski slowly moves back under the covers and scooches right up next to Izuku, snaking an arm around the boy's waist and spooning him from behind. Izuku lifts his head and looks down before glancing back at Koski. Kachan? Koski hummed. What are you doing? Izuku asked quietly, biting his lip. Holding you, like you asked me to, Kotsky says, rounding back to how it had been in the first place. I'm fucking shit at this, but I can try as a friend. Izuku was initially shocked that the blonde had finally admitted that they were friends, but he was also bitter that Kotsky wasn't doing this because he wanted to. Izuku tries to pry Kotsky's arms off his waist frustratingly. I don't want your pity, Kachan. Please, if you didn't want to before, then I don't want to force yourself to do this just because you feel bad. Just get off me. Shut the fuck up, Kotsky growled and pulled him even closer into the taller's chest. I don't do shit I don't want to do. Azuku then stopped his prying and glanced back at Kotsky, but the athlete had his eyes closed. He was surprised. So just stay still and go to bed, Kotsky tells him, voice tired. I'm okay with this, just for tonight. Izuku wanted to say something more, but Kotsky clearly didn't want to talk anymore. So Izuku just laid back down, feeling the warmth of Kotsky's arm against his skin. Izuku was sure that Kotsky had never held someone like this, but it was nice, and it was also something Izuku might possibly regret in the morning, too. Just for tonight, huh? Izuku whispered to himself, as the person behind him drifts into sleep minutes later, and with that, he hopelessly wished that tonight never ended. Koski was right. He did feel slightly awkward around Koski, especially as they were getting ready for school. Koski had actually, actually picked up Azuki's backpack from the awning the night before, and the car ride was a little weird because of the previous night. It was a roller coaster of emotion, emotions, including at the end. They didn't talk about what happened, and Azuki was grateful for that because he honestly would not have known what to say. However, despite it being a little awkward, Izuku knew that in a hangout or two they would be back to normal. This wasn't bound to go for long, and more than the oddity that was last night, Izuku knew at least he promised at least he has the promise made between them that they will both try. Izuku will try to embrace his negative emotions more, and Kotsky will try to embrace his positive ones. It was a quiet day. Izuku knew at some point he needed to go home, but for now he had school which he went as it usually did, nothing too much out of the ordinary, and when it ended, Izuku knew there was team practice outside of the track field in a moment. After all, it was just a Friday. Izuku wonders if he'll do something today, and decides to just go for it, to see if Kotsuki was all bark and no bite, and all talk and no action. Izuku goes to visit the vending machine, buys a cherry Gatorade, and when he leaves the school to walk towards the track field, Instead of watching for the outside, he like he usually does on team practice days when no one is around to see Koski and Izuku interacting, the greenette opens the gate and walks through. He steps over the grass and then onto the poly polyurethane track field. The vultures were simply stretching right now, but upon seeing someone who wasn't part of the team walk up, everyone kind of paused to see. 
the, they knew who he was. Azuka was the boy who always came to watch Koski from afar. Azuka was the town's sweetheart with a rumored exhilarating side. Izuku was someone who was generally known to get along terribly with Bakugo Koski, and yet he was inside of the fence. Kirishima nudged Koski, who had his foot up against the bench, leaned down to tie his track shoes. At the nudge, Koski looked up at Kirishima, who nods in Izuku's direction, and when Koski turns around and makes eye contact and, hold, and holds it, Izuku was slightly nervous, but determined. He was determined to make this the first step in Koski's mission to try. He knew everyone was watching them as Izuku approached the other, even if the rest of the team, including the coach, was pretending to have other conversations. When Izuku was just two feet apart from the star athlete, he stops. This was the Koski he had rarely interacted with, the one who was at school that rarely talked to him, surrounded by people, stars, lights, cameras, editorials, the one whose stage was the world, and whose stars felt too far for Izuku to reach. But today, Izuku decides he'll dis diminish the space in between. Kotsky looks at him as if wondering what he'll do. Azuku simply reached into his bag, pulls out the stupid cherry Gatorade, and he held it out for Kotsky. The blonde looked at him, and then at the bottle extended to him like a gift. The team was most definitely observing their interaction, expecting Kotsky to say something harsh or slap it away. The athlete looked over to his team for a quick second, before back down at Azuku. Without breaking the gaze, Kotsky reached out to the grab the bottle and tells the shorter boy, Thanks, nerd. Azuku didn't know his heart had begun beating fast until he felt massive relief when Koski, in front of everyone, genuinely accepts his gift and offer of care without even a word of thanks. With even a word of thanks. If there was shock within the crowd, Azuku wasn't paying attention. He was instead having a full, his full attention on Koski. Somewhere in the crowd, Azuku was sure Kaido was feeling something, but he couldn't mind that much either. Koski opens the bottle and takes a sip before twisting the cap back on. Izuku holds onto his backpack straps and looks up at the sky. After a moment, Izuku tilts his head back down, the wind blowing strands of green across his eyes, and he smiles up at Koski before, telling the other, I guess I'll head home now. And he turns around, enjoying the weather and the crows perching on the telephone wires, about to walk a couple steps out towards the gate again, when Koski calls out behind him loud enough for people to hear. Oi, nerd, Koski shouts out. Izuku turns his body halfway around and shouts back, Yeah? Koski jogs up to him then and ran a hand through his blonde hair before looking down at the boy. Do you want to watch our practice? From the inside? Izuku's eyes light up and he smiles so brightly as his eyes squint together and then he laughs. Sure.